right, we will call this meeting to order at 6.34 p.m. on August 9th, 2021. Good evening and welcome to the Concord Select Board meeting. This meeting is being recorded and will be available on the Minuteman Media Network. The Concord Select Board will be meeting live and over Zoom for the next several months in accordance with Mass Open Meeting Law. We may from time to time have select board members join the meeting virtually, and we encourage members of the public to continue to access our meetings in person. Thank you for all of you who are attending and by Zoom. Thank you for the Zoom participants. Both locations will be on all our meeting agendas. And I ask you now, if you are here in person, to please uh, switch your phone to the silent mode, which Good idea. I forgot to do too. <laughs> One second here. Okay. All right. Uh, the first item is our consent agenda. So the consent agenda is the town accountant's warrants of August 5th, 2021. Two one-day special liquor licenses, one for Salem Five Bank on uh, October 12th, uh, and the other for Belmont Hill School on September 27th. And then uh, Sunday entertainment licenses for the Concord Players with a variety of performances, six performances in the Performing Arts Center performance of uh, August 15th. And then... Uh, notably a gift acceptance from James Terry and Judith Terry, a gift of $55,000 uh, to the police department sustainable vehicles account for the purchase of a Tesla Model Y to be used as a patrol vehicle. Um, and also $5,000 from James Terry and Judith Terry is a gift to the community services support account to create a gift fund to assist Concord residents under the age of 60 that are not otherwise covered by other support organizations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the gift. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, Is there a second? Yes. Do we have a motion and a second? That's second. That was the motion. motion. All right. Second. Uh, question, Linda. So, and, and I'm assuming that um, we're approving the consent agenda based on all the times as listed um, on, on, the agenda. on the agenda. Yes. I mean, normally do we don't recite every single thing, right? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Great, next we have the town manager's report and the town manager has been on a well-deserved vacation and um, we don't have a written report this week, but um, possibly board members have questions. I have one question about it. I have a couple of quick updates. That Great. Can for you, though. Great. So um, first, I'll, I'll start off with um, COVID, unfortunately, once again. Um, it's been a while since we've had to lead off with COVID news, but, you know, the the Delta variant uh, and the case and, and the case numbers growing um, nationally, uh, you know, are of concern. We are monitoring our case numbers locally. We haven't seen, I don't think, the same kind of rate of increase, but we have seen a few more cases than we did you know, in the earlier part of the summer. And so uh, Health Director Susan Rask, you know, Fire Chief Tom Judge, uh, and, and other members of our emergency operations committee that was formed for COVID have gotten together a couple of times to kind of keep track of things and see where they are. Uh, the guidance that's coming out on masks is, um, you know, different at the federal level than it is at the state level. So we're trying to, I guess, I don't know, say wait and see what happens on that, but that is really what we're trying to do. We have pretty high vaccination rates in Concord, which really mitigates a lot of the risk uh, and so we don't want to overreact to national data locally, uh, but we are watching it and we are watching for trends. And if we decide that we need to go back to some kind of uh, mask mandate or if the guidance from the state changes, uh, we will certainly advise the board of that. Um, but we are we're watching it carefully. Um, another couple of quick items uh, on townhouse. I know we I think I mentioned it in a report two weeks ago, but um, I think we should be fully back in um, middle of next week. I think there are just a few things to work out. There are actually a few offices that are back in there now, kind of soft opening. Um, the see doors how came in. The doors came in, yes. Yeah. The, no, it, it looks really nice. And we're gonna have, um, 
uh, we'll have to have some kind of um, event. Ribbon cutting. Ribbon cutting, uh, rededication or something like that. It, it looks great. I can't wait for everybody to see it. Um, and so we'll have more offices moving in next week. And so by the and then the only other thing is, Kari is here. The the clerk's office really relies on a, a piece of equipment from the state to be able to be in that office. And so that's one of the things that's sort of out of our hands that we're waiting on, which would impact the clerks moving back into the townhouse. But I think by the middle of the, it's scheduled for the middle of next week. So um, I think by the end of next week, we'll be able to give out a, a firm schedule and say, here's when everybody's back. Really the biggest thing they'll have to do is do a pretty thorough cleaning of it because it was, it did get a little messy during the uh, construction. So it needs to be walls cleaned and the whole thing. Um, so, Stephen, do you hmm. anticipate that we'll be um, having select board meetings, um, I guess not next Monday, but starting in September? I, I would hope so. Over there. And would they be in the small hearing room or are we able to have them in that bigger room? Or we don't know yet. Don't know yet. There's the, 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 the hearing room, the town hearing room was used, like the, the select board meeting room was used as storage mm -hmm. for a lot of the stuff mm -hmm. downstairs. And they've been moving all that out. Um, some of the some of the stuff isn't going back to where it was. And so we'll have some disposition of surplus property. We'll have to go through. Uh, we'll have to get it out of there. Uh, and then the, the hearing room is also used as some staging um, for furniture and things like that. So they're, as a part of the cleanup, a little bit better sense. But yeah, our goal is to have us back in there you know, certainly by the end of this month, um, fully operational by the end of this month, um, and then be able to have meetings starting in September. We, we're close. Great. Um, so then a couple of other things, quick items. Um, one is the there's a pre-construction meeting on Subway Road, or maybe it even happened today. Uh, so mm -hmm. that project will be getting underway very soon. Um, we also have an update on... Um, on White Ponds, which was positive. Um, Delia Kay from our lands division received a grant for some water quality assessment work. And so she's working um, with a contractor or a contractor consultant uh, on that. Is that testing, Stephen? It's testing, yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's testing, but the um, they are also, um, Susan uh, and Kate are still monitoring uh, the algae bloom thing that seems to they have a system set up um, mm -hmm. and they it seems to be working pretty well so that's been a, a positive outcome there too uh, and then the other thing is there's a there was a, a tennis tournament a pretty significant tennis tournament at um, the Thoreau Club was it this past weekend Jeremy I don't believe so yeah, yeah. Uh, and I only mention it because it was a, it was a big event for the Thoreau Club but um, the planning for the permitting that was required got a very, very late start. And I just wanted to commend Jeremy, um, the health department and uh, the DPLM staff, the building department, health department, and, and a number of others that really went into overdrive to make sure that they had the work needed to get their permits to have their um, event. So it was, uh, we were able to work with them and get that done. So it was, hopefully everybody had a fun time there. And I think, again, I apologize for the brevity of the report. Um, I think that's about it. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the board? Yeah, I just have a question, Stephen. I kind of brought this up offline a couple of weeks ago, but you were going to give us an update on legal expenses. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully you'll I be able to do that. I think that's on the agenda for next week. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Susan. We've mm -hmm. um, decided to make a whole agenda item out of it so we can talk for you know a few yeah. minutes about it. Okay, great. And, and Mina will be here next week. Okay, great. Um, actually, I should uh, going back to the. Um, we are also talking to schools about COVID, but I also reminded me that the Thoreau School is still um, under repair as well. So people will see a large tent outside of the Thoreau School that will be, I believe, their temporary cafeteria hmm. um, because their cafeteria inside is being used for classroom space. I think they have, there were eight classrooms impacted, some superficially, others down to the studs. Um, and there's also roof repairs that are needed. So um, you'll be seeing some activity over there, but they expect to be able to have the kids back for the opening day. Okay. Um, I got a notice today that a resident at Newbury Court tested positive for COVID and uh, they're fully vaccinated. So it just, I think it continues to hmm. illustrate how even in spite of vaccination status, the transmission is still um, out, you know, feasible. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't know that in mm -hmm. September we'll necessarily be able to meet in person. I hope so. Um, right. 
Okay, right. And we'll just keep an eye on it. And anyone can choose to participate via Zoom. So as far as we know, next week, anyway, we are live again here in this building. Okay, um, Chair's remarks, I only have two brief remarks. Um, as I just said, we'll be meeting next week, August 16th for a regular meeting, um, not a focused meeting. We have a lot of regular business going on and we're going to be able though to have a break um, and cancel the August 23rd and not meet on the 30th. So we'll be having a good break until September 7th, Tuesday after Labor Day, which will be our next meeting after that. Um, we will be having a focus meeting September 20th to discuss um, and brainstorm alternate funding for the middle school. And my other announcement is I neglected to announce last week, the Attorney General ruled that the Transportation Advisory Committee is a public body subject to the open meeting law. So in light of that, we're um, looking at reconsidering the membership and the charge and this will be discussed at a future select board meeting, possibly or probably a focused meeting that we're going to be having on transportation, maybe in October, November, and around then. Can I just uh, make one comment? On sure. That? Um, um, I read the decision of the Attorney General, and the problem with the um, Transportation Committee was that it did not give proper notices and did not keep minutes. There was nothing in that decision that it said anything about correct. the member changing the membership of the committee. That is correct. And so um, if there's a change in the composition or membership of that committee, it has nothing to do with the open meeting law or the attorney general's opinion. Right. Um, Stephen, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think because the, first of all, the, the, we will have a transportation advisory committee meeting, I think next week to review the determination and uh, approve uh, minutes for the, the September 2020 meeting that was cited in the letter. Um, and so uh, there are, because we wanted to have this kind of combination of town staff and town residents working together on transportation issues in a more detailed way than you normally would have, there's a possibility that a town staff are meeting to talk about non-transportation advisory committee, you know, agenda items. There could be an issue with an incident, an accidental um, OML violation. And so we want to avoid that. And so we probably want to look to replace the town staff. The town staff will still attend meetings and still advise the committee and do all that stuff. It just was, we were, we were trying to do it in a, a different way that I, I honestly think was working very well. Um, but, you know, to avoid, you know, like I said, inadvertent open meeting law violations, I, I would recommend we, we change the composition to, so town staff aren't in that position. Right. So we'll, we'll be discussing that at a future meeting. Right. Okay. So our next item is the Colonial Inn. Um, we have a license violation to discuss. Is anyone here from the Colonial Inn tonight? I am Michael Glick. Okay. Oh, oh Henry? Um, because um, I was, uh, uh, was engaged uh, to um, procure the, uh, all of the licenses for the new owners of the Colonial Inn in 2015, um, it, I think it's not appropriate for me to sit on this, uh, on this matter uh, not because I don't think I can be objective about it, but because there might be a um, perception of bias on my part one way or the other. And so I, I would like to excuse myself sure. for this viewing that I will sit outside and I will return when you're finished. All right. All right. Thank Thanks. you, Henry. Okay, so we have here Chief O'Connor and um, Mr. Quick from the Colonial Inn. Um, Chief, do you want to start? Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, good evening, Joseph O'Connor, Chief of Police here, Town of Concord. With me tonight is Detective Keith Harrington, who uh, performs licensing duties for the police department. Uh, contained within your packet tonight were uh, documents, memos, which I sent to the board in your role as the alcohol uh, licensing 
a local licensing authority, as well as some redacted police reports uh, that stated on June 16th uh, this, this year, there was violations uh, at the Colonial Inn, uh, which resulted in a person who was transported to the hospital. Another person who we believe was under the influence of alcohol was also there. I'm giving you a quick summary because I believe you probably reviewed the uh, documents. Uh, I have recommended a one day suspension of, of the license um, due to the seriousness of the event, the emergency vehicles traveling through the town uh, to get to this person to render, render aid and then transport the person to the hospital also in an emergency manner. Uh, sets public safety uh, issue within, within the town for our citizens, as well as the first responders who uh, responded there. I would say that uh, the Colonial Inn uh, is very cooperative with our investigator um, as you look, at, look into this matter, and there have been no other incidents that we've had at the, at the Colonial Inn, and they've always generally been very cooperative with us. Thank you. So there have been no incidents um, in the past three years, is that correct? I don't aware of any other previous incidents. Okay, thank you. Do board members have questions mm -hmm. for the chief or for Mr. Glick or Detective Harrington? Matt? Yeah, I think the question I'd have just given the circumstances is about the training of staff and whether there you would recommend in addition to the, the license uh, suspension, temporary license suspension, any, any kind of you know, additional training or renewal of training. Uh, you know, I just think it, it, I assume the tips training would tell you to do otherwise than, than what the staff did that evening. Right. And, I, and Detective Harrington has had conversations with Mr. Glick, and uh, I'm under the impression that they've reviewed uh, with their staff what the appropriate uh, actions they're supposed to take. I would recommend that. Uh, you know, staff also, you know, take a, an additional course of tips in person is, is our preference. They can do that stuff online now, um, you know, with with COVID, but, uh, you know, we feel in person is always, always a valuable way to go. Um, should the board decide to uh, issue a suspension, the Colonial Inn does have the ability to appeal to the Alcohol Beverage Control Commission uh, to have a fine in lieu of uh, a suspension, but that would be up to the, the management of the inn. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, hey, other questions from board members? Uh, yeah, I just want to clarify. So you're recommending that we not do what's in the statute about first offense is a um, first offense, but because of the seriousness of this particular offense with the involvement of so many emergency personnel that it was it was more than just a... In, in the town's uh, your, your rules and regulations allows you to uh, step beyond that that first warning phase and retraining. Mm -hmm. um, is it, I believe this incident and in the, in the facts that are contained in the report with the person uh, being passed out at the bar, uh, having uh, vomit on, on themselves, that this was a, a more, yeah. more serious incident. Um, and, I, and I can't understate the, uh, the facts of emergency responders, particularly the fire department moving a heavy apparatus through our downtown area to respond to emergency does create a significant public safety concern. Thank you. I had a couple of questions for Mr. Glick. Mm -hmm. So I think that I read that you have um, a, a pool of, of servers that share the tables together. Correct. Okay. At, at that time, yeah, that that has changed at, at the current states. Oh. At, at that time, yes. Um, due to COVID and staffing levels that we continue to have, our servers were pooling as one group on that particular day. Um, that's no longer occurring. Now they have their own stations that if it's four tables or five tables of their own four table stations. Okay, and I guess that would make it easier to keep track to make sure no one's overserved if if you have your own station. For certain. For right, certain. okay, that's good. And my Can other- I statement as well? Sure, okay. sure. And Colonial Inn really, you know, takes alcohol service uh, seriously. You know, we were a small inn uh, representing the town of Concord. You know, we don't feel ourselves to be a a nightclub. I've been there only one year at the end, and it's a COVID year. You know, so obviously our operations are different than they used to be. You know, our tavern really is open as a restaurant, not as a bar. There's no live entertainment. Um, but myself and, and the staff really, you know, were upset that this incident did occur. You know, you know, we believed that at the time I was there that evening. 
I, I wasn't involved with the serving of the guest, but when we called the emergency services, you know, we believed there was actually a medical emergency. We, we didn't realize that was that the guest was intoxicated. I clearly understand upon, you know, witnessing what occurred that night that he was, and I understand that clearly, you know, we were in the wrong in you know, getting that guest, you know, to that in the situation. Uh, so we apologize that that occurred. We have done retraining with our staff and not all retaken tips, uh, which we will do with our staff, um, but we certainly have advised our staff of this particular incident and the stain that we brought upon you know, our in, in in doing this and pointed out points that could have been done differently to avoid this from happening. Uh, so you know we are serious about not letting this happen again at the Columbia Inn. That's very good to hear. So um, th that kind of goes to my question. Um, when I read the reports, it looks like the uh, bartender said at first this gentleman's speech appeared clear and lucid, no sign of intoxication. And then he had one or two sips of wine and suddenly he was passed out. Is there any explanation how, wh why, how that happened? I, I don't. I, mean, I, I didn't interact with the guest until you know after the guest had passed out. Mm -hmm. So I can't you know, render an opinion as to how he was seeming coherent initially. Right. Um, but they had had dinner with us and consumed you know wine prior to the bartender serving them a glass of wine. Right. So so in hindsight, knowing that the, the server did serve them two bottles of wine and then got another glass of wine, you know, when he's by himself at the bar, you know, that would be my supposition. Right. And are those in two different rooms then the dinners mm -hmm. in one room well, they had dinner on the patio right oh. and then this was a hotel guest you know the, the guest that mm -hmm. uh, needed medical assistance uh, is a hotel guest he's, he's a regular he's come like, the past 30 weeks and spent spends the night you know he joins a friend uh so his guests had left the evening and then the guest went to the hotel bar uh it had just opened up earlier that week you know prior to that week the bar had not been open for service you know the, the rules changing so he sat at the uh, tap room bar, ordered a glass of wine. So it was in a different location. So that's my question. How would the bartender know if he's in one room that this guest had two bottles of wine in another room? In the past, we didn't have a procedure for that. You know, now, we've, since this incident occurred, we have put a procedure in place that says if a dining guest or hotel guest mo goes from one area to another area, that we give a heads up saying this guest has joined us from there. Very good. Um, and it might be one glass of wine and we gladly serve a second glass of wine. Sure. And in this case, that, that was not the case. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any more questions from the board? I uh, just comment that I um, appreciate your comments about taking this seriously. Sure. I think the town takes this issue very seriously and um, we appreciate the public safety response. And so thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I guess we're ready for a motion. Yes. So um, I move to impose a one day suspension of the liquor license for the Colonial Inn in response to a violation on June 16th, 2021. So, okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. okay. All right. Thank and you the, very much. The, you know, the specific date and terms, I think. That's All right. Debate. Well, that's right. Um, I think um, Detective Harrington recommended that it happen on the same day of the week, which was a Wednesday. Is that correct? That is in accordance with our ABCC. Right. Yeah. So I think that we that, don't have to include that in our motion necessarily. It would be uh, it, that's pr just standard procedure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. And I think that, that that will work. OK. OK. All right. Thank you very much, um, Chief Detective Harrington, Mr. Glick. Thank you all for coming tonight. Okay, our next item is, oh, we need to, uh, Carlin, could you just let Henry know? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh. It's just shorter that way than the table. So our next item will be to confirm the town calendar. As you know, we voted a May 1st annual town meeting on a Sunday, May 1st, 2022. And we now have a draft calendar to take a look at. Um, I think it's an excellent job. There's one date that I'm going to propose we discuss 
Uh, well, let me see if other board members first have any other comments about Matt. Yeah, I was just curious how the special town meeting and the town wide vote uh, that's expected uh, for the middle school would fit into this. It would have its schedule. own calendar. Yeah, but I mean, I guess we it, it we still need to coordinate it with this. Yes, we right? do, but we don't know yet. I think once the middle school building committee and the school committee decide if they want the special town meeting to be in December or January or whenever, then we can add all those dates. For example, there's we have to have a warrant, you know, and, and open and close. Yeah. Right, we have to have all of yeah. those things. So it's going to have its own mini calendar. Yeah, I was just looking at some of these dates and it just seems a little bit crowded, you know, in the, that time. So, I mean, I think the expectation is that the special town meeting would be in December and then that the vote would be in sometime in January. Is, 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 I, I think that that's what I assumed. Stephen, you must have an idea. Well, I think they're, they're the, it's been a bit of a moving target, as you of know. Of course, it's all the subject to the... We've lost some time in terms of getting through schematic design. Yeah. Uh, and so I was talking to the superintendent this morning about this. And I think she wants to get with the co-chairs of the committee to start to um, frame out a calendar that we could present that they could present to the committee for consideration. Because I think if, if it gets pushed all that much further, it starts to make sense to just roll it into town, town meeting. Yeah. Right, yeah. okay. Um, all right, uh, Linda. So um, I thought in general, this looked good. I did have a couple questions. Um, I assume that the town moderator and the town manager's office and the clerk's office have had a chance to look at this. Yes. Okay, and so and the um, there were two things here. Could they call. actually wrote it. The Good. three of them. We have the moderator there Good. on Zoom. So. Good. Um, uh, it, I was just. I had one question about the the timing between in April, um, just before the town meeting materials are sent to the printer. That seemed awfully close um, between the deadline for submission for town meeting materials and when it went to the printer. But if Chris has looked at this. Um, so it's six day uh, turnaround. Yeah, that's, it's really tight given mm. to get it printed. what's happened in the past. Um, Carmen, do you have some well, there's comments mm -hmm. about this or anything else about the calendar? Uh, uh, sure, I, I think on, on uh, Linda's point about the town meeting materials, we won't have quite as robust a set of town meeting materials uh, this time around as we have in the last two annual town meetings because we will be returning to having uh, vi uh, uh, audiovisual presentations on the articles. So it won't be necessary for uh, people to draft a narrative and include that in the town meeting materials. I think that in essence, the town meeting materials are going to consist of what would in uh, pre-COVID times have been the handouts that would have been on the table. So it will be the motions, any particular handouts that any committee wishes to create uh, or any group of citizens wishes to uh, create on a particular uh, article. Um, and that's really about it. So that it should be a much uh, less substantial document than it has been in the last two cycles. Um, and I, I see Chris is there and Chris and I have talked about this and this, this um, Chris, am I correct that this is a comfortable turnaround time for you? It is, yeah. It, it, the printer we've been working with over the past few years, we've got a great relationship with. And uh, as long as we can stick to these hard deadlines, it shouldn't be a problem. I'm just trying to look out for you, Chris. Thank <laughs> you, Linda. <laughs> the other thing I would note is that the um, the date for the warrant opening is January 15th, and the warrant closing is February 2nd. Um, I, I think this is an idea that has come primarily from the town manager's office, and it's fine, but you just need to be... Uh, 
uh, uh, thoughtful and uh, cognizant about making this change to what our historic procedure has been. Uh, for many, 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 many years, the warrant has been open for 30 days. And um, as I've mentioned previously, I think the only real impact that the shortened time has will be on citizen petitioners because anyone within town government is gonna understand when the town meeting deadlines are and it's not going to impact their schedules. They will focus on when the warrant is closing rather than when it is opening. Uh, but it would be uh, citizen petitioners who would be pinched by this. So, uh, so it's fine. Uh, I would also note that January 15th, I think is a holiday. Uh, so it might not be the ideal day for the town uh, meeting preview meeting. You might wish to Right. Slide that a week earlier, and if you did that, that would both be right. a modif a lesser modification of the time period that the warrant is open, uh, and also take that day off of a um, of a holiday weekend. So that's right. Just a thought. Right. Thank you for mentioning that, Carmen. I saw your email about that, and I was going to mention that as well. Um, Martin Luther King Day is. January 17th, so it's a holiday weekend, um, but also that 30 day period has been a tradition. So one possibility is that we could adopt this whole calendar, except for moving that first date, January 15th, up one week earlier to January 8th. Um, so that's is there, one is possibility. There any, there's no benefit in keeping that period shorter. I mean, and it costs nothing to keep the warrant open. The, right. The amount of, I mean, you could keep it open from December 15th or December 1st if we wanted to. And it, there's no right. there's no downside to that unless what you, you want to discourage people from coming forward with, uh, with uh, petitions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I had another point, um, which is that it, April... 18th is Patriots Day, right. and that is the deadline for sending out the Finance Committee report. And right. so that means that effectively the day for sending that out is the previous the previous Friday or Saturday. Right. I mean Friday because people are probably not going to work and be working on Saturday. So so mm -hmm. that means there are fewer days than indicated effectively. Right. Correct. So, I don't know if that matters, but just noting it. Right. And Linda, did you have another question? Well, um, I like the idea of January 8th being mm -hmm. the date. Um, and the other comment I was going to make had to do with um, down below, holidays and events relevant right. to the schedule. It lists Indigenous Peoples Day, um, which is now a state holiday, I understand. But Columbus Day... If the school department is going slash Columbus Day, correct? Because the state has not. That's uh, right. Thank our, you. Withdrawn yeah. that. Our local bylaw still refers to it as Columbus Day as well. That's a so so a, Linda is right. It should that. say Indigenous Peoples Day slash Columbus Day. That's correct. Okay. And also, thank you, Linda. We got a thank comment you. from a citizen um, to add two other holidays. Jeremy, um, I think you got that. Two other holidays that were requested that are added in the holiday section. So we haven't embedded those. That would be up to the board's discretion. All right. Well, well, we can list as many holidays as we want. It doesn't affect the calendar. So the I, I saw the that correspondence mm -hmm. and um, while I respect the individual people's traditions, um, by listing some traditions and not there's other mm -hmm. traditions um, that could also be on here that aren't on here. So um, I think we should think a little bit about that before just jumping in and doing it. Mm. Hard to know which ones to list and which mm. ones not to, right? Mm -hmm. right? So you're saying right now it only shows um, formal legal holidays. Is that, is that right? Um, well, that's and there, not, are, and there are some. Yeah, there's are some not. others that are tradition. So yeah. hard to know where to put the line then on that. Exactly. Okay. Other comments, questions for Carmen or Chris? Um, I, I like the January 8th suggestion too for the okay. warrant opening or town meeting preview meeting. All right. 
Are we ready for a motion then, I guess? Okay, move to approve the calendar events leading up to the 2022 annual town meeting is included in the meeting materials with the following amendment. Reschedule the town meeting preview meeting and the warrant opening date to January 8th at 9 a.m. Second. Okay, there's a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, great. So, um, Jeremy, if you could post that calendar um, on the website, that would be wonderful. I know a lot of people are eager to get the calendar and get their business going, so that's great. And thank you for your help, Carmen, Chris, Kari, and everyone else who worked on it. Yeah. Now we will turn to the next item, which is the DEI Commission charge. And we have several people with us today, live. And um, Jeremy, how many people do we have on Zoom? Uh, we have 31 participants total. Okay. So we this topic wins the award so far of the year of having the most <laughs> participants, two weeks in a row. Uh, so let's begin with a conversation just with the board. We have here several letters and a draft, uh, some ideas for a draft charge from the League of Women Voters. Uh, who would like to begin? Well, every select board was, member was supposed to be thinking about this and uh, let's see where we're all at. Susan? Um, I, I, it was suggested to me um, by a citizen that the membership, um, it would be good if the membership could include someone from CCHS who was on the racial um, um, the DEI, the Richard, the yeah, DEI. the DEI okay. at the high school, because they did a lot of hard work. And um, I, I think generally that my comment would be that we should draw on people who have experience in this, as well as people who are un, un, underrepresented. Um, okay. But I think there's expertise as evidenced by the letters we received. Okay. So Susan, do you know what, who was on that committee? Was Were there students, teachers, citizens? Uh, uh, the person that suggested it to me said it, it was students. She said it was a student committee. Student and committee. there were, okay. they did a, a, a lot of work and they did some really, some really good work. And it would be helpful for us to have one of those representatives Great. on this committee. And that's another type of diversity that is lacking in a lot of yeah. our committees anyway. Age, yes, that's a good idea. Okay, other ideas? I just had a question about the mission, which is, you know, as the stated, the mission is about in enhancing, increasing cooperation, understanding and dialogue, and then to promote inclusion. But it doesn't really have a sort of a concrete goal to increase the diversity of the population of the town. And I just wonder, you know, do we want to be more concrete? Are we, is that a mission that we would seek that this would lead to? Or, or is it really the more just create the, the social environment in which that might uh, be more encouraged to occur? So as I, I read, I think that's a good question. You know, as I read the good work that had already been done um, on the material that was given to us by the league and representing community input, um, the, I think the social aspect was emphasized, but there was one um, section in there that spoke to bringing recommendations um, with issues in the community as well as mm -hmm. for the, municipal government um, to our attention. Because I mean, when I think of this, I think of town, the town government's hiring practices, sure. zoning bylaws, sure. uh, the, you know, the, the tax policy that we have, you know, really you know, concrete actions to take. I understand as well that we, they need to be accompanied with a, a, a social environment that is welcoming and inclusive. Uh, so, but I just think that we're gonna, we got bigger things that we have to 
do than just that to make any real fundamental change. Yeah. So to that point, I was I was going to mention that um, I in particular liked some of the aspects that were written into the Lincoln um, charge related to this, and they they had a section on expected deliverables. There, yeah. And they also um, spoke to um, when there were issues or recommendations that were identified, whether it were they were community-based, um, directed at community-based recommendations or whether they were directed to municipal mm. uh, recommendations, that they also pair those issues and recommendations with some baseline metrics mm. for how they would mm. proceed to um, begin to work with, you know, that issue a recommendation yeah. and so that we also had some basis for evaluating it and do, first making policy changes at the municipal level if it yeah. concerned us um, and then evaluating it. So I like that aspect of what was in the Lincoln charge um, and maybe just giving more uh, prominence to that in some of the material that was presented to us. Okay. Okay. Other ideas? Yeah, um, you know, kind of further to the comment that I made last week, you, you know, this definition of diversity that's in the initial uh, paragraph under definitions. Mm -hmm. I actually believe that the paragraph that follows is perhaps more to the point um, and that for the sake of a charge, it might be fine to just strike that first paragraph and just to move so that we have you know one paragraph each on diversity equity and inclusion that i think it makes it a, a just a more compact and a more focused uh, mm -hmm. definition so i also noted that i thought it was either we want to keep it broader i think we need one paragraph um as opposed to two separate paragraphs that I found um, not as helpful. Uh, and then the other thing I would just, this is a detail item, but um, not everyone agrees with the terminology Latinx. So to add Hispanic um, okay. to that definition. Latinx slash Hispanic, something like that. Or, or just a separate, a separate item. Category. Okay, okay. Does anyone want to keep some of the first definition and, and incorporate it all in one paragraph, or does everybody just want to have just the second paragraph? When I looked at the examples of the things that the other commissions or committees had done, mm -hmm. I think they all related to things in that second paragraph. Okay. I would suggest we give substantial deference to the um, the source of this um, charge, and that we um, we adopt it to the maximum extent that we can, um, and not make changes that will not make any substantial difference. Because I think uh, the people who are likely to be most active in serving on this committee, uh, I think probably have a significant investment in the contents of this charge. And so I would like to essentially to empower them to the maximum extent that we, we can um, and to give them the opportunity to do the work that they wish to do for the town. I, I don't um, totally disagree with that. Um, I, I do have one concern related to the, I think it's important to um, have some breadth of, um, of the, in terms of the categories of diversity that we're speaking about. Um, but at the same time, if it's way too broad, it's easy to lose the focus on um, some of the, higher area of tensions, I guess I might add. Um, I mean, if we succeed, 
in the first round with the, what's in paragraph two, we can expand the scope later. Well, we also can, um, I think because the task is really difficult to define and how you even measure mm -hmm. uh, the accomplishment of it, that I would, uh, I, I suggest that we would leave it to the committee to narrow the scope to the extent they feel that that uh, would give them the opportunity to actually uh, accomplish more. And so I would leave it to them to try to focus their attention on uh, the most fertile ground for uh, making a difference rather than have us in advance mm -hmm. try to uh, narrow it down. So in other words, part of the um, task of the commission would be to define diversity, equity, and inclusion, rather than have us define it up front uh, before they even get started. If it were up to me, I think if I yeah. were just right, I would have a very brief huh. kind of um, mm -hmm. charge, which just said the first, the first task of the committee is to define their mission. So I think some of the language that um, was picked up um, by in the material that was given to us um, referred to some language from Sudbury that um, used wording like respecting all aspects of identities mm -hmm. in addition to listing um, um, a number of other specific categories. And that may be a way to pull this together um, in one paragraph. Right, and actually that language I see is in here. Mm -hmm. The first paragraph of the mission yeah. might be what we need. And on the third line right there, it yeah, says yeah, respecting yeah. all assets of identities. Maybe we don't need to put in such a specific definition. We just have that first paragraph of the mission might be enough. And the committee could then go get started and come back to us if they want some changes to the charge. Um, our job today, I should say, is we're going to discuss this as a board and then we're going to hear comments from the public. And um, then we're going to have probably one member uh, try to draft something up. Uh, we're not going to finish this charge tonight. So, so one of the other questions I think that will impact how we approach um, the overall charge is what kind of resources will be necessary to mm. for this committee mm -hmm. and where those resources will be coming from. Mm -hmm. um, mm. uh, do you have an example? Well, for example, a consultant, you know, if, they, if there was a budget that was required for this, okay. I think that that could be quite appropriate in this case. All right. Um, and they also, uh, in the uh, long list of examples of the things that they want to do to promote diversity, many of which are kind of like social and civic events, uh, budgets might be required for those activities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, I wanted to mention that I thought that the duties and responsibilities section was particularly crisp. I, I thought it was a nice list. And I don't know that, you know, I would like to kind of step back and make it kind of vague and, and say that the first thing is to figure out your mission. I think that we actually have a fairly well-developed um, charge here. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, a clear, mm -hmm. a clear set of things that someone could do. Mm -hmm. And I, I would really like to see the things that are in those duties and responsibilities. Um, I, I agree, and, and maybe we add one more bullet that is some kind of broad thing, like you know, any other, you know, because it doesn't give. It, well, it does give the last one, which is the opportunity to then come back and review the charge in order to right. understand, assure its mm -hmm. ongoing work is meaningful. Target. I mean, that really opens it up to it can evolve, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's great. I think they did an excellent job, yeah. which is why I included it again um, as a starting point for us to. And while they, I found the examples to be helpful from just the point of view of understanding this, I, I think it doesn't belong in the charge. Per no, se. it doesn't. It's right. just in our packet right. yeah. examples. 
Um, then when it comes to membership, mm -hmm. I would suggest a committee of nine. And the reasoning there is that because the terms would be staggered, that would just give you, you know, three per year to, to roll over. And I think that that would be nice and balanced. The other thing is that I believe that nine would be enough people to kind of give some good representation within the community without being unwieldy in, in terms of trying to hold meetings or, or actually to staff the, the committee, to seat the committee. Do we think that we can get nine um, people, particularly as it's stated here, uh, that with the goal that the majority of members shall be from historically underrepresented groups? Um, certainly that would be our goal. Do we think, we don't want a situation where it's going to take us, you know, six or 12 months to recruit people. And we, we already have, I think we it's, should just try. Yeah, we should definitely try. And, you know, if if we struggle to seat then the committee, then it. we'll. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we're so, going to have a lot of help yeah. in, in identifying people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Yes, I think the public is agreeing with that. Okay, good. Uh, Okay, uh, how about some comments from the public? I will start with the live people who are here tonight. If anyone would like to come up to the microphone. If, oh, Nancy, are you coming? Yeah. Or if you're thinking about it, okay. <laughs> Nancy Brown, 96 Forest Ridge Road. And first off, I'd like to say that we really appreciate the real thought that you have given to this. I think we're on a good track. Uh, I, I would hate to see us just, just toss out most of the things on the first page, because I think that gives not only the committee, but our town some guidance on what this committee is trying to do. But uh, we we're certainly not wedded to any particular wording. If that one paragraph seems superfluous, that's fine. Uh, we, we're, we're getting very excited that, that there's going to be progress. We're moving in the right direction. And I'd just like to say we appreciate how quickly you've risen to this. Well, thank you. Uh, the League has done the work of drafting all of this, which is a huge help. Mm -hmm. And as Henry just said, we're going to also be asking the league and the faith community and schools and everyone to help recruit people for this committee. So definitely it's everybody working together on this. Uh, yes, please come up. My name is Erin Fife. Um, do you know my address? Yes. Oh, one, 174 Hill Street. Um, and I just wanted to uh, say that I appreciated the discussion about a budget for this committee, because I think one of the things um, that will really demonstrate that the town is serious is making sure that the committee is um, able to really affect change. And, and as you've noted, that that may include um, hiring consultant or, or um, other things that will require funding. And I think if we're looking to recruit people, um, we also need to make sure that they understand that we've demonstrated that we're serious. We really want to um, make this committee something that is effective. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else in the live audience? Then we'll turn to the Zoom people. Hi there, I'm Elizabeth Cobbs, 31 Pond View Lane. I'm a newcomer to Concord a year ago, so delighted to be here for the first time. Um, I have been looking at these issues um, across the state. There's so many resources that Massachusetts has. The Boston Foundation has done a lot of research in this area. Um, we have um, Ibram X. Kendi at BU. Um, he has a center. Um, so I think that there are a lot of resources following on Aaron's point about budget, but also that there are 
you know, a lot of movements that are um, very, I'm sure, welcome by others outside of Concord that we could use here in Concord. Um, so I just wanted to alert the committee to those resources. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Louisa Poster from 139 Jenny Dugan Road, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the Concord Carlisle Human Rights Council. I was unable to make the previous meeting, but I'm happy to be here tonight. And mostly I would like to um, thank you for considering all the good work that the League of Women Voters and CORE have done. We've been so impressed with this energy towards this, initi towards this initiative. And um, we fully support all of their um, recommendations. And I was very happy to hear all your discussions about keeping the mission broad and working hard to recruit a very diverse group of people for the committee. We can also help recruit people. Um, and I agree with Aaron's comment about the budget showing um, serious commitment towards it, even if it's a small budget. <laughs> um, and Let's see, I think the whole thing will be such an exciting step for our whole community, um, you know, every single person in the community. So thank you. Thank you. And um, I just wanna make one very quick comment about the budget. I don't want to um, raise false expectations. We are working on a charge now. That doesn't mean that we're working on funding right now. The funding cycle goes through town meetings. So, we're not really in sync with that yet, but we, we will get there. But just so if someone doesn't think there will be a large budget for this tomorrow, it's not gonna come that soon, just. Okay, um, on Zoom, I think I saw Anita Techley. Um, thank you, Terry. I just wanted to clarify uh, in typical league fashion, um, the draft that you're of the charge that you're looking at what evolved um, over a series of, of meetings that took place over, I think it was about six weeks and uh, with lots of input. We, we have a, a good working group of about 20 people meets every other week. And um, so this, you know, the end product was not what we started with. And um, so it, it did evolve. We took, borrowed some pieces, uh, particularly the mission statement uh, is an adaptation of what was in Sudbury's, um, but the definitions um, started smaller. And we, in the course of the six weeks that we um, reviewed this, it evolved we, um, among the league members feeling strongly that it, the broader we make it to start with, the, the um, I would say that with the more direction we would give to the ultimate commission. Normally in a charge, you wouldn't necessarily include definitions, but because we are among ourselves had lots of questions. How do you define diversity, equity, and inclusion? We felt that people looking at this document may also have similar questions. So that this, this is more comprehensive than you would have in a regular charge. And we appreciate the confusion that perhaps that has, has resulted from. Um, you know, the duties and responsibilities were something that um, we developed ourselves and um, to give, again, people an idea of, of what is going to happen. But we anticipate that the commission itself would narrow the focus uh, once they figure out where their expertise and what the need is. You know, one of the first tasks they're going to they're going to do is sort of is assess the need um, in the community. So I, um, this is I, I would consider it a working document. Um, so, I, you know, and we will support whatever version you ultimately um, accept, obviously. We, you know, we do not, as Nancy said, we don't, we are not really adverse to narrowing the scope. Frankly, when we first started, we had one paragraph for diversity and we, um, and we chose to add the second one because we felt it, uh, the first one did not cover everything that we, that we felt it needed to cover. Um, ultimately, it's, it's your decision, but I just wanted you to realize we, we did not just crank this out overnight. This really was a, an, uh, a document that evolved over the course of several weeks and several meetings and involved about 20 people. So thank you. Thank you. Um, other people from Zoom who wish to comment? Mm -hmm. We have uh, Linda Ziffrin. Linda, if you want to go ahead. No, oh, we have uh, Vivian Tang, if you'd like to go ahead. 
Yes. Hi, Vivian Sang, 1128 Old Marlboro Road. Two comments, please. Uh, first, I, I want to speak in favor of allowing the commission itself to redefine the charge as part of their work. Um, I, in, in, the, in the discussion about focus versus breadth of mission, I want to remind everybody how we came to this point. Why is the country talking about anti-racism? Why is the country and almost every municipality talking about DEIC? It is because of the murder of a black man, George Floyd, that uh, um, has been characterized by many as having awakened the country to the historic injustice. And, and in that vein, you know, there's much to be said about being broad and inclusive in the, in the um, general sense of the word. There's, but there's much more to be said about the necessity of focus. Mm -hmm. and, and I believe that the focus has to be on what is our historic challenge, which is what, what has the history of slavery the enslavement of Black people uh, engendered in this country, um, culturally, politically, economically, socially, philosophically, uh, and, and, and that is white supremacy. If we, if we don't keep our eye on the prize, which I would submit is dismantling white supremacy, we would not make real progress. So that, that's just one cautionary note for the work of the commission. And secondly, you know, in terms of recruiting for membership in the commission, there are certainly many organizations who's already doing the work and, and many very well qualified and uh, experienced individuals who are, who have been in this anti-racist space for quite a while and whose learnings can greatly benefit mm -hmm. the work of the commission. By the same token, it is very critical for the commission to be populated by the affected uh, demographics, I would say. For example, the schools, all of the schools, elementary, middle, and, and high, high school need to be represented. The educators need to be represented and the students need to be represented because I think that is where a lot of the work is focused on. And so I would recommend for your consideration, sort of, um, I don't know, requirement might be too strong of a word, but, but and, you know, recruiting from the parent associations, from the teachers association, and the student representatives of the, the, the schools that, that we have in Concord and Carlisle um, as, as potential members of the commission. Okay, thank you, Vivian. Any other comments from people on Zoom or from the public that is here today? Um, would the board have additional comments? Um, yeah, I, I just think that um, so far we've heard about five comments about the drafting and you know, we talked about maybe going away and, and redrafting. And in fact, we do have a meeting next um, yes. week. But I just wondered if I could just briefly walk through what I've heard as potential feedback so that maybe it's almost just a, a, a you know, simple revision mm -hmm. that is Great. discussed Take here rather away. than just, you know, throwing words in the air and re redoing it. Because indeed, there has been a lot of work done. May I ask before you start that, if I could just... Go ahead, Linda. Um, Terry asked if there were any other quick comments. And one comment I would make is that um, somebody from the library um, it, on the membership, um, it included in the membership, I think would give a, a, town, a, a excellent town-wide platform for all kinds of uh, distribution or uh, of events, ideas, communications, all kinds of things. Okay. Engagement mm -hmm. with the public. 
it seems like though we would need to speak with the library first to see if they're ready to do that though right i mean with staff we often with... we often define categories of what we think should be represented um right we and... often do that and then if we can't recruit anybody we have an example of that tonight as a matter of fact <laughs> okay um we have the library trustees the friends of the library the library committee we have hello yeah there might be someone in, out of all those groups um Matt, so are I, you proposing sharing your screen or how do you want to do this? Uh, gosh, I hadn't thought about that. I'm not on the Zoom. All, um, all right, just go but, through it the way you want. But yeah, so I think the the first comment that we've had, though there have been discussions in both directions, is about possibly uh, consolidating the diversity mm -hmm. uh, the definition to a single paragraph. My proposal had been just to use the second paragraph as the starting point. Uh, given that it also ends with and other groups, uh, but that um, there have been debates about either being as broad as possible or focusing. So I think that's the sort of most open-ended feedback that we've had so far that would be, I think we need to just come to consensus on how that should be dealt with. Right. The other comments are very straightforward. So adding Hispanic in the uh, list of, of groups, Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if others agreed with my suggestion of making the uh, commission nine uh, members. I like that idea. Yeah, I do. Um, then adding a member from the library and a member from the school DEI uh, committee. Okay. Uh, among the other members. Um, and I believe that's it. That's great. I, I mean, so I almost we're almost at the level of if 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 it was as simple as, for example, striking that first paragraph under definition, well, we would have we would have a charge. Okay, I have a suggestion about that. So we heard debate on both sides, and um, what I'm thinking is I'm kind of thinking along the lines of what Linda said. Um, I don't know if you meant this exactly, Linda, but to make it. Uh, grammatically the same or something to have one paragraph for diversity, just like we have one paragraph for equity and one for inclusion. And so I was thinking of having the second paragraph there where um, it says diversity especially refers to population groups that have been historically underrepresented, da 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 da, da. But then, you know, we could also put in you know, combining these paragraphs, in other words, but but saying especially refers to the groups that are historically represented. Well, um, maybe what we should do is have an inclusive process, since this is uh, right. In inclusion is one of the goals here. Right. Um, so why don't we table this for tonight, just and offer the opportunity for folks to comment on this this yes. issue in particular. And maybe even suggest a consolidated paragraph. Right. Um, and and uh, I also wanted to say there was one other comment that I didn't uh, address, which was the question about the commission setting, uh, updating its own charge. And I would have to say that I like instead the last bullet of the existing rules, uh, you know, duties and responsibilities, which is they could come to us right. in order to do that. I, I think having the the commission change its charge on its own, it 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 makes it very difficult to understand what what a charge is, even. Um, right. So. I agree with that. I was thinking that. Um, the commission would be encouraged to look at its charge and to come as often as they want to, you know, yeah, to assess, assure it's meaningful target. Well, and to purpose. suggest amendments, changes, and, and probably the select board would be amenable to all of those, if not most of those changes, but just so that we're kept in the loop of what's happening. I do agree that I like this last bullet. And then we need the boilerplate about open meeting right all yeah, yeah. Of interest and so on and so it's on. in there it? yeah it's in there they'll choose a chair and a clerk all meetings will comply with the provisions of open meeting law public records law conflicts of interest right it's in the membership section under membership um so i think matt is correct um we do have uh pretty much a good charge as, as anita said the 
league spent many, many meetings on this already and um, saved us quite a bit of time. So that boil plate can be lifted and just moved in a more standard format that we're used to. Okay, not so, putting it under memory. Yeah, let's just put this in the usual A, B, C, D thing that we have. Like okay. A is purpose and B is membership, but all the wording can be. Um, okay. So I think I'd like to have a motion that we accept this charge as Matt. I, I say let's wait until next yeah. week. Oh, oh, I yeah. see. All right, yeah. well, I see what you're saying. Okay, so let's see if we get some language then, and in the meantime, update the charge to reflect all these comments. Right, right. And right. Okay. Um, and then we'll I think have a relatively compact motion <laughs> next week. Okay. Okay. So, I don't think one week is going to. No, no. I think we could probably finalize it next week. Yeah. Um, and in the meantime, anyone interested in um, serving on this commission or nominating your friends, your neighbors, your colleagues, please um, go online. But you can't submit a green card yet. Yes, right? you can. Well, I actually I did DEI. create the slot for a just DEI commission oh, on, the, on the green card okay. database, just in okay. case anybody wants Thank to you. submit an advance. So. All right, so um, go ahead and start thinking about people who should be serving on this. Um, I know one of the people who spoke tonight has put in a green card, so thank you. So. That's great. Thanks in advance to everyone who worked on this mm -hmm. and in advance to everyone who's going to do the job. Okay. All right. So our next item is going to be finalize and adopt the charge for the fiber broadband completion committee. We'll Wait a moment here. That's fine. We'll we'll get organized here. Thank you. Thank you. So last week uh, we had a draft. And we have what might be a final draft tonight. Basically, I took all the comments from last week and there weren't a lot of changes since last week. There is one possible major change um, that may be something we'll talk about. But first, let's see, what do members think about the changes that are shown here in this, you have two versions. Yeah. One's got track changes and one's a clean one. Um, I guess, you know, my feeling about this is similar to the kind of comments I've made about other charges is, I just still think that we should eliminate as much language that's really just, um, you know, background. Um, that really should focus on what is it that this committee should be doing. Mm -hmm. And so, like, um, you know, the fiber optic network is clearly a valuable asset to the town. I, I don't, and even today, fiber provides fast, reliable broadband. I think that what we could skip those paragraphs um, and even Article 41 asked for this and the small yeah. steps and conservative goals. I think that we would just go right from the first paragraph to the one that says the FBCC mm -hmm. will study. Um, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think any of the rest is essential to the charge. Um, okay. So it would say the purpose of the fiber broadband completion task force is to study and recommend appropriate solutions for the completion of Concord's fiber optic network known as Concord Light Broadband so that this network can offer broadband service throughout the town. And then the FBCC will study. Yeah. Da, da, da. Okay, how do other people feel about that? I agree, um, but I wanted to also um, and 
um, discuss the the focus of the committee, which I really think is the completion of um, expanding broadband to the 20 to 25 percent of the households of the residences that don't have it. And I'm, I, I don't think and I think you, you want to have some really uh, technical folks on the committee, but I'm not sure this has already been said and I've been thinking about it. That uh, that barriers to subscription growth are is part of that. It's more the focus is why, how do we uh, physically get this to happen or technically, and how much is it going to cost, and how is that all going to work, as opposed to a marketing piece of it. Um, I think that's plenty for a. Um, a group to undertake. Um, so, Susan, are you referring to um, on on the next to last page where where it's got an A, B, and C? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and B. You're taking. Yeah. You want to take out B. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have Article Forty One in front of me. I don't know if anyone does. Some of these things. Might have been specified, in, but I don't remember if this exactly was. Stephen's looking Steven's that up. Yeah, great. Uh, let's go to the next comment while we look that up. Um, Linda, Henry, do you have some comments on this charge? No. Okay. So I, I do agree that um, reference in that second paragraph uh, reference to the five to seven percent <coughs> of residential parcels representing 20 to 25 percent of individual addresses not currently getting service. I, I really think that needs to be kept and included. The second paragraph. Mm -hmm. the, certainly the last beginning with a recent GIS data analysis. Okay. I, I'd be fine with that. Yeah. Okay. So just add that onto the end of the first paragraph. Okay. And I think um, often we make direct reference to the article that gave birth to a new committee charge. Um, so whether we reference that down below somewhere or. Mm -hmm. And it's in the background, yeah. yeah. It's just that, yeah, I mean, that that sentence doesn't really, it, it says Article 41, urge the town manager to increase the availability yeah. no. and work towards 100% completion. It, it, that sentence doesn't actually say, and create this committee, which is actually what this charge is about. Yeah, so you could- So, so you it's could, really talking about stuff that's outside of the scope of this charge. You, you could almost ask it, ask this the title of the committee and then down at the very bottom just uh, see article 41 of the um, mm -hmm. or yeah as as, mm -hmm. as voted by town meeting yeah, yeah you know as authorized yeah i think i'll put that as, by town meeting that's as, a better way I as think. requested mm -hmm. by article 41 or of the mandated or yeah, right. required or right. voted voted, voted. voted. Yeah. okay all right great um was the question whether or not those three ABC, I right. know yeah. they were in the, in the motion is, you know, here to yeah. here, and then the narrative is several pages after right. that, which is really what is kind of front ending this, but the, it was the, the, the requirements were expanding installation, okay, well, then we need to keep those barriers, three. investigating opportunities, prepare reports. What does it say about um, um, barriers? What, it, <clears throat> what is the verb? Exploring barriers to conquer light broadband subscription growth. Yeah, so yeah, it's right. verbatim. So that's not okay. in the background narrative. That's actually in the real world. That's in the motion. Right. right. So okay. we'll, we'll keep that. Yeah, and keep that, that, was, that was okay. intended. But um, then the, the other thing on membership, I just wonder if we should highlight that the citizens at large, you know, are we're going to emphasize citizens at large that have expertise, expertise in, the, mm -hmm. in the field. Um, Okay. I say, I say yes to the yes. 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 With expertise. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. And then um, I thought that the- well, What is the name of this field? Telecommunications? Um, in the, I mean, broadband. in broadband networking field, hmm. even better. Well, that might be too narrow. Well, I mean, with a, with a emphasis on those that have or something with a, a preference for something okay. like that. Um, once again, we can't, we can't force people to join the committee, but, or the task force. Um, and then um, I thought that the section on dues and responsibilities was fine, except for that, that um, the, as a starting point for its recommend, yeah, I, I mentioned this last time, I just would get rid of the, the whole list of stuff that is, should be in the report. I think that the, you know, um, shall be divided into the report shall be divided into three aspects of completion set forth in article 41 and repeated in section a above that's fine but then below i don't know shall include the following items i i don't know that that is all needed the one two three four five right the one two yeah. three four five and then the you know all the stuff even that follows the a b c that follows i don't think any of that is necessary well but the, the abc we just said came right out of the email right no, but we don't need to detail out what's in each of those right in the charge the the, the task force will come up with all those things what does they mean by the last five seven percent of streets what do they mean by we, we in the charge we just say these three things we as say a, a, the thing b the thing c okay you see what yeah. i mean yeah, so yeah, i don't yeah. think any of this section mm -hmm. and and that would make it a much more compact charge much closer to what a normal charge would look like mm -hmm. um and then we have d and, and that's all normal so Okay. Um, and we're eliminating the appendix, right, to the charge. Well, yeah. If you've referenced it, right. Yeah. Now we can now we can eliminate that. Okay. I do think that the people whose input we saw, such as the petitioner and CMLP, they did give a lot of thought to this and. All of this language comes from those people, and they may argue to keep it all in, but it's hard into to the charge. I mean, again, I expect that the report would have all this in it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Which is the thing that will last beyond the task force. Some of those people are likely to be on the committee, and they're going to reference Article Forty One and see it anyway. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So. I mean, a charge is just, hey, here, let's get going. Here's how many people, here's what you're going to study, go to. Okay. Um, are there public comments uh, from live public comments, anybody? Uh, public comments on Zoom? Um, we have David Allen, who has standards. David, if you want to go ahead. David Allen? Let's see. Well, won't let me turn on my camera. Perhaps you can hear me. We can hear you. Great. Uh, would request that uh, you circulate early enough for uh, the community of uh, interested folk, of which there are a number out here, uh, this revision so we can all take a look at it and, of course, uh, offer thoughts once we have that. And I appreciate your discussion this evening. I thought it was uh, quite effective. Thanks. Okay. All right. So I will, um, I will put together what I've heard tonight and we will take another look next week. Yeah, I think we'll be able to vote. I think we yeah, will too. Just... I think I, if I goofed it's it just up, trying to write a, a motion on this with those yeah. changes. No, 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 no. We're not ready yeah. to do that. Yeah. Um, I mean, there is also a philosophical discussion about how much this task force can actually take on in the first six months. Yeah. Well, that's my one concern, of course, is that, you know, it's another it's another week. That six months is only 26 weeks. So, you know, we just took 4% of their time. Um, so, Actually, you know. now that we have the calendar, 
I'm going to take a look at that February one. Maybe it can go out another couple of weeks or something. It's supposed to be one week before. I mean, I think that the recruiting mm -hmm. should start now, just like with DEI. Absolutely. We try to get Absolutely. this so that we could just right. fire the starting gun. When, okay. When... <laughs> yeah. So maybe next week we'll even start appointing people to uh, some or, of these Or committees. nominating at least. Yeah, yeah. nominating. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean. Okay, very good. So let's move on now to the year end transfers. We have Carrie LaFleur, finance director here. I'm here this evening to talk to you about the final budget adjustments that we need for fiscal 21, which is the year that ended June 30, 2021. Uh, before I start, I just want to uh, mention a couple of things that I want to make sure people understand the action that's being proposed. Um, so the fiscal 2021 budget was um, approved. It was approved at, at the town meeting in in 2020, and then it was just adjusted at the annual town meeting. And I think there are some questions about why two weeks before the year ended, did we make some adjustments and then we get to the end of the year and we need some additional adjustments. Well, and take money out of the same fund and put it back in this. Yeah, you know, so yeah. I, I'm yeah. Here, yeah. here to talk about that this evening. So I think the, the first thing to keep in mind is that even with these adjustments, we will be closing the fiscal 2021 budget with an unspent appropriation or surplus of about $1.2 million. And we have already committed about 867,000 of that to carry forward into fiscal 2022, but we will still be returning over $300,000 to free cash. So I, I wanted to, to make that point. Carrie, and, um, just remind us, what is that being carried forward into? Is it one or two big projects or lots of things? It is, it is just being carried forward to offset the entire budget, oh. the entire fiscal 2022 budget. And this is somewhat unusual, and it really has to do with the fact that the last two fiscal years, because of COVID, our operations haven't been at 100%, uh, but we've budgeted and raised revenue for 100%, but we haven't expended it. So rather than having that unexpended amount close to free cash and then raise it again, it makes sense mm -hmm. to, from a, a taxpayer's perspective, perspective just to sort of recapture that and use that to fund the budget. Um, so, and I also wanna make sure people understand these are transfers. So we're just requesting to move from already appropriated line items to, to other line items. This isn't a, a request for additional spending. So just getting back then to, to the transfers, we have two transfers that, that remain. One is public safety. There is, and I'll mention there is a, a memo in your packet. One is public safety, and the request here is to uh, transfer $150,000 into public safety. And then one is debt service, and the request is to transfer $40,000 into debt service. And these amounts would be coming from our insurance accounts. So in total, $190,000 from, in, from insurance. And the reason we have surplus in insurance is we're making estimates about how many eligible employees will be taking health insurance benefits and what our uh, property liability and casualty insurance premiums will be you know, several months in advance of, of when we do those renewals. So we do have funds available there. Um, so the, the, the question, uh, Matt, that, that you asked, you know, why are we doing this now? And, you well, know- and taking in, money from public safety right. and then giving it back to public safety. Right, and so honestly, in, in hindsight, I, I wish I could kick myself because when we started looking at the budget adjustments that were needed, and we really started in January, we're really tracking the budget to, to see how we're going to end up. We had quite a surplus in public safety. And the reason we had a surplus is be, because of all of the CARES funding that was coming in. We, we had a good sense of you know, what types of expenses would be eligible for reimbursement. And we also had vacancies um, in public safety and we had uh, newer officers, both in police fire coming in and they're coming in at lower salaries. And, and we really had a, a huge surplus. And I probably should have said 
to myself, 30 years in government, don't ever, don't ever expect to have anything left over in public safety. Um, but the, the choices we had then really were this big amount that we thought we would have in public safety. We also had a big amount in our, in our community services, social services, which really was coming from the library. And we did have a discussion at the at the um, the 2020 annual town meeting. People were were concerned about mm -hmm. taking from the library, thinking that that somehow we would be maybe yeah. either reducing services mm -hmm. there, or that that unspent money would be put in a bucket just for the library. And so the town manager and I talked it through, and we said, okay, let's go with public safety. Um, in hindsight. Again, I should have said public safety never has, has anything left over, but that's, that's the decision that we made. So then what happened between um, the last two weeks? And it, it's really, it's town meeting happened June 13th. The, the year closes June 30, mm -hmm. but we are processing um, fast and furious until, June 5th, uh, until July 15th, because mm -hmm. I mentioned in the, the information that was distributed that the process that we follow and the process that really most communities follow is departments have access to their budget through June 30th. And so they can make commitments against their budget until June 30th, and then the invoices come in and we're processing those. And it's, it's really quite a process to get all of those processed by July 15th. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, come up with exactly all of the transfers that you need. And I, I do mention in the packet that uh, we certainly could back up that date. And I have worked in other communities where they say, no, you can't, even though the budget goes through June 30th, you need to stop June 15th mm -hmm. or earlier than that. We certainly could do, do that. It would make things earlier. We haven't really had a problem here. I've been here for five years now. We haven't really had a big problem running things through June 30, but this year is, it's, it's just it's crazy. Year. It's really, it's really crazy. So when I talked to the finance committee about this, they asked questions about, are you concerned with the, with the closing process? Do you expect that this is going to be a problem going forward? And no, I, I don't based on the, my brief history here with the town, with working with all of the department managers, it's just very, very difficult with COVID. And, and I, I mentioned the, the adjustments because when this was presented to the finance committee um, on July 22nd, based on what we were seeing, we thought we needed much larger transfers in public safety. What has happened since then is we continue to submit documentation um, to our liaison at the state regarding the CARES funding. And we're just getting better information on what they will cover. And in, in public safety, it really has to do with the police expenditure. So early mm -hmm. on, we had a, a real good understanding of what fire OT expenses CARES would cover, but we had a much, much less of an understanding in terms of police. And as everybody is working through all of these expenses, we're just getting approvals on last year's expenditures to be covered through CARES. And we feel, and I'm sure you do as well, it's beneficial for us to keep working at this because the, the more that we can get reimbursed, the less that we have to pay locally. So it is, it's messy. It's an embarrassment to me because I, as I said, I, I should have said, you know what, we, we have the money left over in, um, in the library and, and that's where it should come from. And people should understand that the library has not, for the, the entire of fiscal 21, the library has not been at 100%. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and there have been some vacancies at the library that haven't been filled because, you know, why, why fill the vacancies if, if you're not going to, if you're not yet open? And that was the case for most of the year. So that, that's really, um, and I apologize that it is as messy as it is. In, uh, so, so Carrie, it sounds like, um, there's two main things that happen in public safety, if I got this right. One is just the COVID, everyone trying to understand and the state keep changing the rules and trying to understand what is covered and what's not. And 
So hopefully we won't go through that with ARPA. We'll, we'll, we'll figure out what we're doing. And so that should be solved. And the other thing that I guess came up was this, um, I, I'm reading in this memo, uh, largely a result of the unbudgeted purchase of cruisers. Can you talk about that? For sure. Um, and, and I just wanna say, I, I, I don't want anybody to think that the state has been changing its mind. It's just, this is, a, it's, it's fluid, it's evolving, evolving. And, and we're getting, we're getting better information. So it, it, it's not, um, okay. we're, we're all going through this together. So the one thing that I, um, I don't believe that I mentioned in public safety, if, if you look at, on the second page in, in this very, this chart that's probably very hard to read, you can see that the, the net adjustment that was made to public safety is about $152,000. And the, the transfer we're looking for right now is for $150,000. Um, we have one $5,000 adjustment that we're still waiting for. So, so it shows it shows the the deficit is about one hundred forty five thousand, mm -hmm. but I'm asking for one hundred and fifty because we have one other piece that's mm -hmm. in play, a, a small piece. So in in terms of the uh, if we hadn't made any adjustment to public safety, they they would have been in the black just barely at the end of the year. And so the issue with the cruisers and town manager certainly can jump in if, if I'm uh, not providing enough clarity. The, the police chief was looking at his budget, believing that he had the money in, in the budget and he would have except for that transfer. And so I think there was uh, just a, a, a misread of what was available, what would be left over in the budget to purchase those cruisers. I just have a question about that. What is the normal turnover? I mean, I thought that those things are kind of in their capital budget equipment like that. And I wondered in a typical year, how many vehicles do they cruisers? I don't know how many there are altogether, but how many would they purchase? So in, in a typical year, they would be purchasing two to three marked cruisers. And uh, what I've learned through this process is that historically the town has not included the unmarked cruisers in the capital plan, but that at the end of the year, if there is funding available, those unmarked cruisers are being replaced because they're not, they're not on the same replacement schedule as the marked cruisers. Now, going forward, we want to include everything in the capital plan. Okay. And so we will be doing that going forward. But there has been a, a long term pattern of replacing the unmarked cruisers with budget surplus if it remains. I mean, how old were the ones that were replaced? Yeah, I don't know that off the top. I have the chief prepare a, a replacement schedule. Because it just is kind of odd to have a su sort of surprise purchase of cruisers. Well, well, um, well, at FinCom, they said something that I didn't follow about some chips that were. I mean, even if it's opportunistic to say. Yeah, well, because there was a chip problem. They were, I, yeah, I don't know. Part of, the, part of the issue was that we were advised by our supplier that there was a bat, like you had to basically purchase the vehicle and put your order in now to get it. In a few months, I think there was a, a longer, much longer lead time than normal for um, police vehicles, because, for all vehicles, as we've discovered, because of chips. And so because they had the funds available and they requested, could they advance, you know, use FY21 money to place these orders? And we said yes. Um, I just have a, a clarification question. On the, the first page of the August 6th memo, it says 400000 for public safety, but you're talking about it was $150,000. Correct. So the, the first page is what originally went to the Finance Committee okay. on July 22nd. Okay. Got and it. then we have even better information now and have been able to reduce the amount needed. And that's what's on this detail. That's what's on the second page. Okay. Um, I have another question about in the memo from July 15th. 
this is on the second page, quite near the end. Um, it says surplus appropriations exist in nine lines 12 and 13. Those are insurance lines, I think. Yes. Um, due to actual expense being less and significant portions of unemployment expense covered by the federal government. And then when I looked on this the de more detailed chart for uh, lines 12 and 13, there's nothing in the grant reimbursement part, um, column for, so I wondered what the um, federal funds were that covered unemployment expense. Sure, so that, and I, I'm not remembering the, the exact name of the program, hmm. that the, for a period of time, the federal government was offering a, an extra unemployment benefit amount um, that was, that originally, or there was, there was also a lot of fraud that was associated with with those claims. So originally the town was being charged for um, what we were later able to identify as fraudulent claims. The reason it's not showing here is it, um, we never had to pay it. It was accumulating at our unemployment with the, with the DUA, with mm -hmm. our account with the DUA. And it has since been collected or resolved the issues have been resolved so it's not showing there because it's not anything that we paid out and and it came back in as a reason as a reimbursement mm -hmm. it was just a liability on our account that was cleared through the um, investigation of of the claims thank you how does the gifted vehicle that we noted in the consent agenda tonight fit into the I don't know if it's one for you or it's work for. I haven't had that discussion with the chief about what that does to the replacement schedule. Um, that obviously happens the week before last or something like that. Where that was kind it of, kind of a surprise? Yeah, it really. Was a surprise. It was the Friday before I <laughs> left for vacation. I was Somebody like, it was a great, says, hey, off to a great start. Take a Tesla. Uh, no, and um, and the Terry's are are very generous, and yeah. I think yeah. we we saw it the same way, which we didn't want to make it a, a, an administrative vehicle. We yeah. wanted to be an interceptor because I think we visualize an all electric fleet, including our interceptors. And so and they're is, pretty quick. Those, those Teslas, yeah, they, they get around. Uh, and so um, we haven't really even had, I mean, I, I think the chief is doing his research in terms of how do the onboard electrical systems that go along with patrol yeah. cars interface with the clothes. Trivial. Right. Yeah. Because uh, I remember this when hybrids came out, it was, that was the big issue was the yeah. interface of the electrical I thought systems. Their outfits, that, that's their whole job yeah. is to they, make they, that happen. They do it, but I think it's what I've seen is predominantly administrative, which is a different, they do have some aftermarket electrical stuff, but not like a patrol car. Okay. So I we, we're working on that. I mean, I think the idea is we won't have to replace at the at the end of this fiscal year, we won't have to replace anything one, else but gonna have. I, I need to go through the list with, with the chief and confirm that. Um okay. and then wait hopefully because of the chips. Yeah, I mean we didn't want to we didn't want to wait till June or sorry July to process with FY22 and, and lose when everybody when every other community that has a July 1st mm -hmm. fiscal year date puts their orders in, we thought we could, our, our supplier led, uh, told us that we could kind of stay ahead of the line if we did it. And because we had the, we did, and then we didn't, and then we did. No, I meant for the Tesla that you haven't gotten. Oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's gonna be a long lead time as well yeah. too. Okay. Great. <laughs> I wanted to comment about um, the end of your memo, Terry, that um, you're suggest, oh, I had a comment and a question mm -hmm. that, um, this could be uh, tightened up in, a little bit in terms of the uh, spending dates, where you say department spending and or commitment of funds will would need to cease on or about June 15th. Would it really need to cease or would it be like a pause while everybody looks at the numbers and then you know gets permission from the town manager saying it wouldn't have to be like totally ceasing it, right? Well, the, I, I like cease. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and the reason I say that is because, so our process is any purchase over $2,000 requires a purchase order. Anything under $2,000 doesn't require a purchase order. 
So the only things that we see in finance or in theory see in finance before a money is committed is something over $2,000. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So there, you, there are many departments that have small budgets that, that a purchase of $1,500 or multiple purchases of mm -hmm. $1,500 is not gonna be in our system until the bill is paid. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's very, it, I, I would be concerned okay. that there mm -hmm. still would be issues. Um, I if, see. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Hmm. Do people have other questions for Carrie or for Steve? So Carrie, if I understand you correctly, oh. um, not strictly enforcing um, MGL chapter 24 as many other communities are also not doing is where you want to stay at this point. Am I understanding that correctly or? Um, I think I am, or I shouldn't say I think, I, I'm open. I understand that the concern that maybe you have, that, that maybe finance committee members have, that maybe some members of the public have, that it, the law says that the transfers need to occur by July 15th at the latest. Um, I, I can tell you, I've, I've worked, most of the communities I've worked in, we, we endeavor to, to get to that date, but it is impossible to do that unless you move, if, unless you mm -hmm. cut off your purchases at least two weeks ahead of time, because you can't, you can't continue to encumber to, to the 30th and then expect mm -hmm. that vendors have submitted all of the bills and that you've gotten all of those bills processed. So I have had conversations, as I, I mentioned, with our auditor, yep. because when I when I came here, the audit firm that the town of Concord uses is one I had you worked with many, many years ago, but didn't have any recent history with that firm. So I talked to them about the practice because this is a longstanding practice of the town as it is with many other towns. And he indicated that he understood the difficulty in meeting that and that that this practice would never be a management letter issue for him. Um, and, and that has been the same with other firms that I have, have used, but I don't, I'm certainly not opposed. I am the, the world's biggest rule follower. So to stand here and say, this one doesn't bother me. Um, I don't have any issue if there is discomfort among the boards that have to approve this in making changes so that we can get you to where you're comfortable uh, because it's- On the other hand, the flexibility benefits the town, does it not? The, the, there are, it does affect impact operations at, at right, in the, right in the middle, especially for public works and others that it's right in the middle of their busiest time of year. Uh, in the town I was in, yeah. we did cut off or attempt to cut off um invoices and expenditures at june 15th and it, it created its own set of headaches Correct. for the organization and so i think and this is one of those things that um legislatures sometimes know that it's a problem but it would take them too much effort to make the change to the legislation that really needs to be done to make it reflect what actually happens out in communities so they just kind of accept that this is the, the, the way it is and so i think if i had a preference it would be to do it the way we do it, even though I do it, but, but to try and get it as close as possible. And, and Carrie really did push this year to try and get these done by the 15th. Um, but at the same time, being able to use all of the fiscal year's resources for all of the fiscal year is also important mm -hmm. for operation. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing that might help a little bit is um, it said somewhere that the select board traditionally wants to wait until after the finance committee votes. Mm -hmm. um, I personally don't care if it's easier to schedule it the other way around. And, and I don't know if members agree with me, but that might help save a week or even two weeks. And I don't know how I, I think we should wait for this finance committee. Yeah, I think I just, that's a clearer yeah. process. Okay. Even if it puts us into August. Or, well, I mean, it's, okay. It, okay. What would be the consequence of non-compliance with chapter 44 uh, if, if it were enforced? By the department of revenue. I mean, what would happen if, if it 
Robert. Yeah, so so really this the same thing, you know, we've had when we were talking about legal services, you know, what, what happens if if we don't make that budget adjustment. So it, it's the, it would be the same consequences as what we've talked about before that we would have a deficit in an account and we wouldn't have the legal authority to have that deficit. So it would need to be raised on the recap, the tax recap the following year. So it would just come out of a different budget essentially. Yes, but we would we would have to so say it's fifty thousand dollars and, and we had it somewhere else in the budget, but we missed the deadline or or we didn't comply and the Department of Revenue said you can't do that. So that fifty thousand dollars falls to fund balance for that year. So you raised it, you didn't use it, it goes into our savings. And then the following year, you're going to raise that same $50,000. Now you could, in theory, you could say that you'll have town meeting pay it out of free cash. So you, you could do that. But, but absent that, you're essentially taxing people twice, which we don't want to do. But uh, just for that amount. For that amount, correct. Okay. Any additional questions or comments? Are we ready for a motion on this? Move to approve the FY21 year end transfers as included in the meeting materials. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Carrie. Thank Thanks, you. Carrie. <laughs> Okay, our next item is economic vitality division reorganization. So we had a discussion of this last week, and I think a number of people were ready to vote at that time. Um, I was one of the people who was not ready to vote. I had several conversations with Stephen and Carrie since then. Um, is does anybody have any questions before I? Yeah, I just have ahead, one, yeah. and, and I unfortunately don't have all the details right in front of me, but I attended a recreation commission meeting this past week, and um, in the course of that meeting, uh, the recreation director said, there's this fund we can't spend anymore, and thank goodness we still have money that we can still do this event. And, and so it seemed like there was some problem, I don't know, with the allocation of the reallocation of funds that might be impacting the, the recreation department. I, I wasn't very clear on what was being said, but it was strike striking, I guess, that there seemed to be a fund that's no longer accessible to the, to that uh, department. I'm not aware of that. It, it's hard with that amount of information. Yeah, I'm sorry. What, I, I should have um, like a button down answer, but yeah. it, it, it was the, a the, topic at the meeting. The, the funding for this activity that was previously run through the rec revolving fund, it, it's just oh, the funding. Sure. Yeah. It's, it's just the money that's generated from the visitor center that mm -hmm. was, was being, is proposed to be moved into the general fund. this uh, twenty four thousand five hundred dollar right. yeah. fund but you're saying the recreation uh, department doesn't pay for any other temporary status employees out of that fund typically not not out of this this fund so we have we have the rec revolving fund that has um, a couple of different activities that is run through it but we do segregate them we have like sub revolving funds uh -huh. if you will and this one is just for the visitor center and visitor center activity they have other um are certain... there any recreation department activities that were paid out of the visitor center budget in the past do you mean like an activity some sort of like, activity no, yeah it, some it, activity it, it, it was like it, i thought it was like an event it was like a one day event um it, that you know, like the Christmas tree lighting or something like that. Um, it, again, I'm sorry. Well, we can, I know all these vague. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's the the structural the, the point of all the cages here. We if she, we can let her she can comment yeah. on that. But um, the point of the of the uh, of the of the proposal is really just um, alignment for um, ease and to facilitate um, more efficient economic vitality. As I explained, I think in the first presentation, because we're going from revolving fund to general fund. There's going to be a transition that's not right. that, need, that may take a couple of years to get us to create a special revenue account. So there's going to be a couple of um, things to work out as we go. But I know uh, Carrie, Kate, and Marsha have been you know discussing this at length, and and we have a plan. It just um, okay. you know it's 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 complicated. I guess it's it's. Um, Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to ensure that the complications weren't getting in the way of. Yeah, Kate, okay, if you want to add to that. Can, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Hi, sorry. I'm having an issue with my camera, so you get to stare <coughs> at just my face there. But um, uh, Matt, I think what, um, what Anna was talking about was um, a fundraiser that they were having at Trails End. Uh -huh. um, and the fundraiser um, is actually for camp scholarships through the Danner DiStefano um, mm -hmm. fund. Uh, and that, that actually doesn't have anything to do with tourism or economic vitality. When, uh, when Danner DiStefano, who was the longtime rec director was retiring, a group of citizens raised quite a bit of money actually um, in his name and in his honor for um, kids to be able to attend various summer camps. And over the years, um, that has been uh, used up and there's about $20,000 left. And so there's an effort um, to sort of rebuild that fund to a, a healthier balance in the wake both of COVID and, and just seeing that camps are becoming more expensive. Um, and I'm sorry, I missed the, the second question. You asked, it, are there other things that are run through revolving? Well, I guess the, yeah, the question was that I guess they said that, and, and I'm sorry, I don't even want to try to raise it because I may have misunderstood. It was about that they there was a fund that you could no longer use, but fortunately this activity was not in that fund. So they were able to proceed with the event. That was the, that's my recollection. And okay. it, Turns out it wasn't an impediment, but I just wanted to ensure that, you know, this reshuffling of funds in order to support this organizational change is not creating any impediments to the operations of these departments. That's all. And the activities that they're able to support. Sure. I see. Um, so I can, I can dig in a little more, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's about the Danner DiStefano fund. And, um, as far as, uh, I think that the hardship, it's not really a hardship, but I think that the complication um, money-wise is, is going to come basically to DPLM from REC revolving because, of course, the revolving of fund has a little bit more leeway as far as um, I, e expending things. And so, you know, creating a, a separate revolving account for visitor and tourism services, I think, is something that, that the manager is... Um, is thinking about it, and I think that that'll probably be helpful for Marsha. Okay, I have um, some related questions to this too. So, the budget that was voted <laughs> at town meeting that was in the general government is is that right? And and we're going to need to trans do a transfer to DPLM sometime before the end of the year. I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. Did you want me to take, so the money that you allocated or that was allocated at, um, at town meeting is uh, a, an amount that was in the revolving account. I'm sorry, that was in the general fund. Um, I don't think that you necessarily need to transfer it from one department to another. It would just be that, you know, Marsha would be the custodian of those funds um, versus it being in my office. Okay, so that, that's my next question was uh, who prepared the budget and who, who will be monitoring it? So it sounds like it's Marsha. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then my last question is how much revenue for the tourism program came in approximately last year through the revolving fund? And what's the estimate for this year? Um, 
because now it's going to come in the general fund, I guess. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think we go ahead, Carrie. So our our assumption is that thirty two thousand two hundred and fifty dollars is the revenue associated with the tours for F one twenty two for um, thirty thirty two two fifty was for fiscal twenty one mm -hmm. and yeah about about that same amount. It's not. It's not as. It's not as clear to see because when you look at fiscal twenty two, all of that activity is then folded into right. a combined. Yeah. Um, but yes, okay. We the assumption is about the same. Okay. Right now. Okay. Thank you. Other questions from anybody? No. Okay. More other questions? All right. Um, I think we're ready for a motion on this one. We do have a, a question from the public or a comment from the public. Oh, we do. Okay. Uh, Greg Higgins. Greg Higgins. Hi. Hi, uh, Greg Higgins here, 51 Cottage Lane. Um, I'm, I'm here as the president of the Concord Business Partnership. And we want to thank the chair and the board for this opportunity to speak tonight and to the town for uh, the creation of the economic vitality and tourism position as a great support to our center's businesses. <clears throat> we had several business development position folks uh, from towns, uh, Bedford, Lexington, Hudson, and a few others come to our meetings and discuss their methods of supporting their local stores and businesses. They tend to report directly to the town manager's office. However, we support the proposition of having the division report to the director of, of uh, PLM uh, 141 Kai's Road plays a direct role in almost all of the things impacting our businesses and therefore understand and support its position, positioning it there. Uh, we want to thank, uh, thanks for the time and appreciate it and think that uh, Beth Williams will, will be a wonderful uh, addition to the town staff and hopefully um, foster uh, some progress in our business community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Okay, I did. I just found the transcript from the uh, meet, commission meeting, and so I can give you Anna's quote, um, which maybe I was misunderstanding the context. So um, the, she said that um, the road race this year, uh, which has typically um, been housed through the Recreation Revolving Fund and the Hunt Recreation Center, but moving forward, any and all fitness and exercise-based events are going to be run through the BD Center so that the funds hit the enterprise account. So we're working creatively to fill and create some program opportunities that aren't necessarily right in the swim lanes or the fitness rooms throughout town. So these are some new things coming. So that that's a totally, totally different, thing, yeah. totally different issue. Okay, because okay, you know, in the context of all this, it just sounded like, oh, they're having to avoid using this fund, and they're they're using the BD Center fund instead. So that that's what I was concerned I think about. That's, and Kate, correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's kind of a business development change for BD, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Um, it was similar to what we were doing with having. White Pond become um, sort of an auspice of BD as well. So that if you received a membership to BD, you in turn had a membership to White Pond and vice versa. And so we're, we're trying to generate revenue for BD outside of BD's four walls. Okay. Thanks. All right, I think we're ready for a vote here. Uh, so, uh, move to approve the economic vitality division reorganization as proposed by the town manager in the meeting materials. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? I'm, I'm going to oppose based on um, a comment that we made last week. I, I appreciate getting all the answers to most of these questions now. But I still am not totally comfortable yet with it, and I feel 
someone made a comment, I think it was you, Matt, that maybe one more year of smoothing this out might help. So I, 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 vote, I vote no. So four to one, I guess, is our vote okay. on that one. Yeah. Okay. But I totally support the idea of it. And thank you, Greg, for your comments. And thank you, Carrie. Now we will move on to the Civil War Monument Task Force. Uh, Henry, do you want to talk about this? Thank you for doing the draft. Well, thank you. Uh, this is, uh, I, I see, this is, uh, in effect, this is D DEI in action. Um, and that is that the, um, it all arose um, from uh, the recognition that um, a uh, Black citizen of Concord who served in the Civil War uh, was not placed on the, uh, the, uh, the bronze plaque on the uh, Civil War monument. And so um, I was asked to help uh, the cemetery director in uh, putting together a um, group of people who could review the standards that were used to place names on uh, that particular monument. And to, to and because the original, um, originally plaque, the plaque was originally on that monument has been changed twice in subsequent years. It doesn't have the, the quite, quite the um, uh, standing that it might have if it was the original, the real original one. And <clears throat> so um, the idea was to make a final judgment on those people who should be included on that plaque and then for the, uh, to have a ad hoc committee which would be a, a, um, a six month uh, lifespan to come back and make a recommendation to the, uh, to the board about uh, what should be done to uh, remedy this situation and <clears throat> whether it should be, uh, the, plaque, the plaque should be replaced and to make a decision about the criteria for inclusion and if necessary to um, recommend changes to the ACP that, uh, that related to the placement of names on uh, on the town um, uh, of war memorials. So, um, so we took the um, the information and the reason that this one has a lot of narrative on it. I know that I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to Matt's comment that <clears throat> um, narrative is not only is not always useful in charges. But here, I think, actually, for the benefit of the people who will serve on this committee, to have the history uh, and the the background of the uh, of the issue uh, be described in one place where it's easily accessible will be helpful to them. And so, uh, uh, this uh, most of this historical narrative was put together by Kate Hopkins, and. Um, and then we uh, wanted to, um, since the, the object was to um, review uh, the appropriateness of inclusion of names, um, uh, uh, we wanted to have that ad hoc committee have people who had expertise and experience in historic in history and uh, the Civil War, um, so that they could. Um, it was not to be broadly representative. It was to be. So a group of experts to make uh, to make these decisions and to come back to the board with recommendations about inclusion, about the type of change that should be made, and to decide there were um, uh, there were some who thought that there rather than um, make changes to the existing monument, there should be some kind of separate monument, which I think our sense was that that would not be appropriate. Um, and that all, all of the Congress Civil War veterans should be treated exactly the same. Um, but that would be a recommendation that would be made by the committee. And um, there are already several people who are uh, I'm told are happy to serve on the committee, that there are funds available to implement this decision, both from the town and from private sources. Um, uh, should the decision be to replace the bronze plaque on the Civil War monument. And um, um, 
That's about it. But we okay. expect to get a report from them in six months. All right. Thank you, uh, Linda. Thank you for all your work on this, and um, it looks good. Um, I would just like to add a little bit more narrative. Sorry, Matt. <laughs> but uh, for the benefit of the committee members, as you point out, um, on February 22nd, 2021, the select board unanimously voted to authorize the town manager to have a separate plaque um, honoring um, George Dugan. George Dugan. George Dugan. Yeah, George Dugan. George Dugan. Um, and then it just goes on to say the rest of the, and and also the the vote ends by saying, um, and also encourage further study of the George Washington Dugan's plans in the um, original monument. So I hate to have that piece of history and vote that was taken by the select board not included. Well, I have, I have no problem. I don't think that. <clears throat> You don't think that's important? Well, no, I'm not saying I don't think it's important. Um, I think that that's a decision that really needs to be reconsidered because uh, basically of the really core principle of Brown versus Board of Education that separate is not equal. And therefore that there that should be a separate monument, I think needs to be reconsidered as to whether that would be an appropriate resolution. So the resolution conclu uh, concludes by saying, and we encourage further study of the George Washington Dugan's um, place in the original on the original monument. I think I think so, on this point, if I may, is yeah. that you go from Rick Freeze um, in 2014 to May 20 to Shopkins going to the Historic District Commission. She was only there as a result of that vote. And she's going back in November. Right. And she's going and, back and, in November. And, I, and she actually she was there. The, the, so we with the limitations that had been identified in your narrative about add, about changing the actual monument plaque, we had determined that this was um, a, 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 maybe another a, 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 a not as good but also an appropriate way to honor George Dugan's service. And so I asked Tish to lead the charge on presenting that to the Historic District Commission. And so that. And then that picks up on your narrative on May 20th. So I, I agree with Linda that it's an important step in the process. I, um, we anticipated that this would follow. In other words, this fact, so if you want to have that added to the narrative, right. I have no, I really don't have a problem right, with, with doing that. I don't okay. certainly would not. Okay, we're the, 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 uh, the point is to get the job done. Right. Sure. So Linda, if you could send that, get that wording to Henry sure. and um, he can. Yeah. Or yeah. you can, or you can add it in Linda, whichever. Yeah, I just had two, two other quick okay. comments, if I may. Um, I was wondering um, on section D if you had really meant to say, but I hear you now in your narrative say plaque, and it says tablet, so I didn't want, I didn't want it confused. All right, it's on the. Yeah, fifth line, yeah. replacing the tablet. Yeah, and I think he, in his um, verbal um, description, he's using the word plaque, which make it, I, I think is is correct. Okay. Because tablet is listed in some of the background information. You know, it says a new tablet was made to the five to add yeah. these five names in the nineteen fifteen town meeting. Yeah. Anyway, what, whatever, however we handle, yeah. handle that should be consistent. And then the only other um, comment I would make, and again, thank you for all the work on this. This is great that this is in play, um, is that uh, I'm wondering if we need to make reference um, for the committee to consider um, federal and state regulations and traditions regarding Civil War memorials. And the only reason I'm suggesting that is that did come up in the discussion that Trish uh, that's Trish the Lott, reason Trish why they Lott couldn't do it board. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so I can send me that wording as well okay and where would that go in the duties and responsibilities yeah, some, yes okay yeah. great so I had a question really about the scope of the task force because 
while it did cross my mind as I was reading through the background, whether that belonged in the charge, I actually was sympathetic to including it in the charge uh, just for the reasons that you were saying, Henry. But when I got to the bullets that said, you know, in 1998, the family of a veteran that had recently died and had been in Pearl Harbor, and then the next one, which talks about a veteran's name for the Vietnam Memorial, I wondered why we were departing from the specific issue of George Dugan's place in history. Um, and and I, I now understand that in the when I got to the duties and responsibilities, it said at the end, in addition, it shall make recommendations with regard to possible amendments to Act 26, uh, which is the guidelines for placement of names and war memorials, of which those two other examples would be informative as to you know whether this this should be done but i just wonder just very much in line with the comments i made about the other committees uh, you know is that do we really want to expand the charge beyond this very clear issue around george dugan um, at, at, at this time maybe you can come back at the end of the of the report you know or or and do that then but i just don't know that we need to Go because it, all those issues it, that Linda raised about the status of you know federal and state you know approaches to these things, I think they really expand dramatically when you go to other conflicts. The reason that those are in there, and I had and I share your uh, share your reservations about putting them in. They had been in the original <laughs> narrative that was given to me, and. <clears throat> I, I probably should have explained that um, the only reason they're there is not to include those people, but rather to show the kinds of uh, almost irrelevant reasons that have been given in the past for not including people, um, such as the man who drowned on his on the boat to Cuba yeah. because it could not be determined whether he died of his war injuries or the, from drowning. And so um, I, I, I would be happy to take those out. The reason they were there is to essentially, as I say, um, show that how um, particular people had been about um, using almost irrational criteria for either inclusion or exclusion. Yeah, so I would just suggest take those two out. I think because otherwise everything is very focused on George Dugan and it, and it just makes a very nice backgrounder. Well, what about this part? In addition, it shall make recommendations. With I think that that's okay if yeah. the if the report okay. you know uses its experience to do that. Now it, it won't necessarily change Act Twenty Six, mm -hmm. and to change Act Twenty Six, we might need to form another task force. God. But uh, you know, it, it'd be good to get that, at least the momentum going in terms of uh, the input. I just think it's just too big a scope if you. Right. Yeah. right. Okay, I'm good with that. I have a question about the membership. Um, do we want to include uh, one person from Historic Commission, one from HDC, one from Cemetery Commission? Or do we just want to leave it broad? I think we just leave it like this because, first of all, we've got lots of people that have to be serving on different other groups, and it's just a stress for people. I think that mm -hmm. also this is a very focused issue now. Right. And I, I think that the special skills right. and knowledge will be very helpful, and everyone will appreciate it. Right. I result. think the reason I bring that up is because they have had strong opinions about this in the past. I, I wouldn't want. How about if we say it could include a member because, you know, that way then we don't run into an app 10 issue. Or how about, oh, right. No, it wouldn't be an app 10 issue because it would be like the uh, CPC or something where they. Well, only the, if the charge indicates that it could be a member from there. Right. But Mike, maybe it should say in their duties and responsibilities that they consult with these three groups. I don't want them to come in with one recommendation. Then we hear from one of these other committees that they disagree. You know, we want to come in with one solution. Well, it's it's going to have to be uh, in the, the resolution. I think will have to be endorsed by the historical commission mm -hmm. and the HDC in any event. Right. So, how about before they come back to the select board, they go over it with those two bodies. And then when everyone agrees, then they come back with their recommendation. 
who could just say that they will consult. Yes, yes. We'll consult with HBC and historical. By the way, the, the November uh, body they're going in front of is not the HBC. Uh, I think it's a historical commission. Right. They may need to consult with both. I, I don't yeah. know. Okay. Well, I, I'm sure it is. And maybe the cemetery committee, but maybe not then. Um, okay. Well, I think essentially, uh, Ms. Hawkins is going to be acting as the mm -hmm. staff person for this uh, right. committee. Right. So am I... I assume we're not going to um, vote this one tonight. We'll vote it next week with those changes, or are they compact yeah. enough that we could do it? Um, Give me your stuff, and I'll do it. Okay. Yeah, I yeah. Think so that let's, that that's what we'll do, stuff, and we'll yeah. vote it. We'll vote it next week. All right, yeah. great. Okay, we are on to the draft town manager evaluation. So tonight we're just. Um, announcing there is a draft, um, five select board members from F FY21 participated, so that included Jane Hotchkiss, uh, 12 SMT and 18 uh, division managers from the staff participated. We also have Stephen's self-evaluation. Um, next week, we will um, approve the final eval so if any select board members uh, have comments on the select board portion of it, please get them to me by, um, let's say, early Thursday morning so that I can get them in the packet. Um, yeah, Wednesday night, Thursday morning would be the latest. So I have Thursday to get them in and we'll have a final eval next week and do not reply all just send them to me I, I would just also like to appreciate the amount of work that this must have yes. taken to pull together and secondly to thank uh the town staff that participated yes. at a mm -hmm. very high level of participation it was very impressive mm -hmm. yes 30, so, 30 out of 35 people. i mean Yes. The, the the evaluation is very unwieldy as a consequence of all the content that's there, but it's very comprehensive. And I think, well, anyway, I, I'll, right. I'll hold my comments. No, I'm glad you said that. And I want yeah. to thank Amy Foley for all the time that she put in. Uh, it was an enormous amount of time getting getting the staff and we had a great response rate. So, okay, our next item is appoint liaison to the Regional Emergency Communication Center Board. So. Henry was kind enough to go to the first meeting and I've um, been thinking it over. I think we do need a liaison and um, I have the fewest assignments. Uh, so I'm gonna volunteer to do this one unless if someone else really wants it, that's great. But I'm happy to do it if um, people want me to. I think you're the perfect person. <laughs> <laughs> I think you were the biggest advocate for this uh, on the board. I mean, as far as I know, I mean, I think, I think we all idea. voted for it, but the, the still. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we'll have a motion for yeah. that. Um, except for me, I didn't end up voting for it. it right. Because okay. of a. Another step. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Okay. Move yeah. to appoint Terry Ackerman as the liaison to the Regional Communications Center Board. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Yeah, I voted for it before I voted against it. That's okay. Right. <laughs> All right. We are on uh, certifying the town meeting home rule petitions. So we need a formal vote to ratify Article 31. Uh, for the FY20, for the 2021 town meeting, and two other articles for the previous year's town meeting that we uh, didn't take a formal ratification vote, I'm told. So we need to do that now. Okay. So the town clerk's office is responsible for doing that. So to give some, some background on this, yes, so um, a couple weeks ago, Chris and I, uh, our town manager's office got a memo from 
or I got a certified uh, notarized copy of Article 31 from the 2021 town meeting from the town clerk's office. Right. Uh, and, and Kari Tari said that we needed to have the select board vote to uh, ratify it and send it to our legislators. Now, of course, Linda, you and Stephen last year just sent them in without, we didn't take the formal vote, but we still got them to the legislature. Well, and we worked with the clerk's office on this, so we thought we were, had met the Right, so so I don't think there's, there's not necessarily like a problem or anything, because they're going through the legislative process, the 2020 articles. Yeah. Um, but we brought this to Stephen. Stephen, you can correct me or add anything. Um, but uh, Stephen checked in with uh, town council, who advised us to take this yeah, formal vote. No so. it's just I'm, I'm just surprised because we uh, it's right. Right. It's right. Yeah, it's, I feel like isn't that what the vote normally says on the home room petitions? It says with such terms as the select board may, um, you know, on such terms as the select board may uh, approve or something to that effect. Um, and I assume that the actual legislation is drafted or reviewed by town council uh, before it's, it comes to us. Is that correct? I think it gets reviewed and drafted by the ledge council. Um, and sometimes, some, sometimes town council, sometimes I mean, by, by, yeah. by, by, by council of one strike or another. <laughs> right. Yes. And, and to, to, I felt like we asked these questions last year and got different answers. That's yeah. That's all I can say about us. I think you're I, right. I was here last year. Yeah. <laughs> and if I was, I would have forgotten. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was, seems like, I did forget. <laughs> yeah, it seems like a new procedure to me. I thought the town clerk ratifying it was what we needed to do, and then send it off. Because but, yeah, because the legislature uh, asked us for a um, seal, a sealed copy from the clerk. So mm -hmm. all right, okay. Uh, I, I. I can't see a downside for us to ratify. Can you? No. Well, it just makes us responsible for the consequences. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> okay. Move to ratify the 2021 ATM Article 31 Home Rule Legislation and Bylaw Amendment Regulation of Fossil Fuel Infrastructure. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Move to ratify the 2020 Annual Town Meeting Article 50, Authorized Special Legislation, Additional Liquor Licenses. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Move to ratify the 2020 Annual Town Meeting Article 15, Authorized Special Legislation, Senior Means Tested, Property Tax Exemption. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. Now, the long list of committee, committee nominations, and thank you to everybody who is yes. volunteering to serve on these committees. So, Corey Atkins of Five Concord Green to the PEG Access Advisory Committee for a term to expire on April 30th, 2024. Sarah Grimwood of 520 Lexington Road to the Natural Resources Commission representative to the Community Preservation Committee for a term to expire April 30th, 2023. Charles Phillips of 65 Fairhaven Road to serve as the Housing Authority representative to the Community Preservation Committee for a term to expire April 30th, 2024. Burton Flint of 1643 Main Street to serve as the Planning Board representative to the Community Preservation Committee for a term to expire April 30th, 2022. Paul Baum of 11 Ridgewood Road to serve as the Recreation Commission representative to Community Preservation Committee for the term to expire on April 30th, 2023. Grace Shimone of uh, 10 Dana Road to the Agricultural Commission Committee as an associate member for the term to expire on April 30th, 2024. Alexa Anderson of 14 Park Lane to serve as the school committee representative to the Middle School Building Committee for a term to expire at the completion of the project. And Heather Bow of 33 Alden Road to the Middle School Building Committee for a term to expire January 31st, 2022. And now to the appointments. Bradley Hubbard Nelson of 20, uh, 221 Neshotic Road to the Comprehensive Sustainability and Energy Committee for a term to expire April 30th, 2024. Sarah Passell of 1712 Monument Street to the Library Committee for a term to expire on April 30th, 2024. Mary Rand Vanderwilden of 15, uh, 158 Simon Willard Road to the Library Committee to serve as an associate member for a term to expire on April 30th, 2022. Second. 
All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, Linda. Um, can I just go back to the committee nominations for a second? Sure. Um, um, I see Heather Bout is uh, listed here for the Middle School Building Committee for a term to expire January 31, 2022. Yes. I understand the committee's needs for um, communications person and, and retaining your expertise, but I thought there was um, some question about um, the school committee has used all of their they positions have, yes. in yes. terms of appointments. Right. So this would be so the here, it, board um, relinquishing their spot for her to fill. And so I just want to make sure that we're all aware that's what we're doing. Well, so well in fact, it's actually a shuffle. It was yeah. more of a shuffle than that. Okay. So, okay. so today, as it stands, uh, Don Duriello, who is the co-chair, is, you know, we have various call-outs of different types of members. Right. Uh, she is serving currently in the capacity of a member with a school-aged child. Um, what we propose to do in the interim is that there is a, a person, a construction industry personnel slot, which we ideally would want to have with someone who is a, you know, a contractor, can, you know, an engineer, you know, civil engineer type. But actually, technically, because there is not really a call out for an architect, that because Dawn, you know, her profession is architecture, specifically of public school buildings. <laughs> um, she has a, a lot of construction oversight experience. So really from the perspective of the, the charge, I think could be um, typified as, as that representative, which would then for Heather, give her the slot that would remain for a uh, community member with school-aged children, because indeed she does. Yeah. So okay. for the near term now, I, I, and that's the other thing is that we assume that through the town vote, is the most critical time to have this communications expertise. And that during the construction phase is the most critical time to have a civil engineer on board. And we have not been able to fill so far, we've, we've approached a number of candidates, we have not been able to fill that position. Right. So we are really, and it's only a five month term. So the idea is this is an interim period, five months, we'll give it a, you know, time to, first of all, keep the, the project momentum going from a communications perspective, but a very short, uh, you know, term, term end date, uh, which uh, has been discussed with Heather and she's, she's on board with, um, to make room for a, a dedicated construction industry per, per, you know, right. professional. And, and let me just add one thing to that, which is that Matt has really been trying, as of others, to recruit someone with construction experience for many months. I think I, I just wanted to get comment about that. There was this, there was, it was very deliberate to put a construction person in there. And what happened I, is that once the committee made the decision to do, um, not to do- Design bid build. Design bid build rather than the construction manager, manager at risk. risk um, all of the people who had construction background had not been in favor of design build build. So once that decision was made, the interest mm -hmm. was not there on the right. part. Or the people that we had contacted, right? Which isn't exhaustive, obviously, but um, there was a you know a reason for that specific skill set to be included. And we still need it. Um, and we still need it, and we still hope to recruit it. Right. So if you're listening and you have construction experience, please contact us. We, we want so, if I can just pursue it just a little bit further. Um, I, um, so if I understood you correctly, Matt, um, Heather's expectation now is that she would step down after January. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so how is the communication need going to be met going forward? Because Oh, well, it's not like it's going away. No. Right. Well, and you know, there is, um, you know, there, the, the, on the town side of the membership, you know, we also have recently uh, lost Kate Hanley, right? And right. so she will be replaced. So we, we are trying to constitute a communication subcommittee, you know, with multiple members so that there will be some continuity when Heather steps down. Um, and there's also the possibility that some other member may choose to step down in the interim, you know, 
So we, we don't know where we'll land by then. We're just trying to make the best of yeah. the current circumstances. So um, I appreciate all this and I, I know she's been a valuable asset to that and that's yes. important to have that continuity. Yes. So I, but I do think that we all need to just be aware of what's transpiring there. So thank oh, you. Thank of you course, I mean, yes. I, you know, absolutely. Yes. Um, yep. And this was kind of the best we could right. work out. Right, we tried a number of ways to Finagle it. This was the best. I mean, I, you know, with. my my hope had been that the school committee would, vote, you know, just leave Heather in place because she was already appointed for the term of the project, but they chose not to do that. So, okay. So, oh, now I am confused. So the school committee, who is the school? Oh, Alexa, Alexa Anderson. Anderson. Okay. Yeah. So she's and a school the committee other member. school committee member is um, Court Booth. Court Booth. Right. Court, right. So Court is court remaining, is, yeah. and Alexa's joining. She's. They, and then that, they felt that, that the eliminates right. Heather's they, slot. They so. felt it was really important to have current members of the school committee on. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I get it. Okay. All right. We are now on um, committee appointments from the town manager. I don't think we have any today. And now we are on committee liaison reports, and we didn't do them last week, so oh, we're shoot. going to do them uh -oh. now. Uh-oh. I, <laughs> I didn't do, I had nothing this week, but I did have, oh dear, I'm sorry, I don't have my notes from you the week You can before. bring it next time. Okay. If you but mind. I did want to say, I went to an MMA um, session on the future of meetings and they talked about um they talked about zoom and about a couple other technologies but the one person present was from the town of franklin who happened to just mention in the context of something else it's a it's a not a whole lot different from our population but they have 17 committees and boards oh my god and i thought that the contrast was quite striking wow i'd love so, to see that list and, well you just go and, on the town website yeah. and get wow. this mostly regulatory stuff let's <laughs> invite them to our focus meeting <laughs> have them tell us what to do here oh boy we've added four or five committees right. here already <laughs> yes. okay <laughs> who would like to go next mm -hmm. for liaison reports i have a few all uh, right henry um uh, brief though i went to the Ag committee uh, focus their meeting aside from the uh, uh, plague of worms that they're encountering. Um, is they're getting they're making preparations for Ag Day, um, uh, which we discussed earlier, and that was the bulk of the meeting talking about that. And they're going to have uh, their next meeting the day uh, before the uh, Ag Day to make the final preparations. Sounds like all the arrangements with the town in terms of the banner and the police coverage and all that has been um, taken care of. And uh, I think they are soliciting uh, people to be exhibitors and participants in the tape booths at the event. And that's September 11th, right? September 11th, yeah. And, and if, if someone wants to have a booth, who do they contact? They should probably um, contact the they can contact me. Why don't I? Oh, All right. That? Okay. And I'll pass that along. Okay. Um, because I'm easy to find. Okay. Um, and I went to the Board of Registrars meeting. Uh, you may or may not be aware that they are going through the redistricting process. Uh, to uh, They are required by law to rearrange uh, our precincts. Um, uh, for, um, and there's a, a deadline which is coming up fairly soon, and it has absolutely no impact on any electoral events because um, <clears throat> there are no uh, no uh, uh, positions, elected positions, where people are uh, elected by precinct. However, what they're concerned about is having them uh, um, having them. Um, um, Structured so that it, to provide the most convenience for voters. Yes, um, great. And if, to the extent possible, for people to be able to vote near where they live. Um, there's one other issue that they are waiting to hear about, and that is that there's, apparently there's some um, legislation pending uh, about the um, 
uh, congressional redistricting. Mm -hmm. And if the um, uh, if in the unlikely event that the uh, town is divided between more than one mm -hmm. congressional district, um, they want to make sure that the uh, precincts line up with mm -hmm. the uh, congressional district lines. Otherwise, you'll have people. Mm -hmm. oh. um, Right. Yeah. In one precinct in two congressional districts, yeah, right. which will make it difficult. And we will be hearing from them because we need that we need to approve what they have uh, come up with. And they have some. They have a geographer who is actually you know, helping them with a, top, a topology to put together mm -hmm. the district. It's kind of interesting with the the different colors mm -hmm. and trying to have equal population and have mm -hmm. them being able to vote in a convenient places yep. and also take into account the fact that with um, increasing, uh, assuming the state passes or continues the legislation to allow uh, mail-in uh, mail voting, uh, the number of people that need to be served may be significantly, significantly reduced so that some of the polling places can be uh, combined. So that's mm -hmm. the, the Henry. What, what's the timetable on that? If something is, I forget exactly what it is, but there's, we're talking about, uh, I think they have to do the bulk of their work before the end of September. Oh, so they'll be coming to the select board probably in the next late, few months. Probably late in September oh, or early good. October. Okay. So I just want, want to clarify. So will they have the information about possible redistricting? Within the town, in order, you know, to include. The I mean, yeah, uh, uh, I think they're sweating that one out. Yeah, and is the basis for population distribution? Is that the basis for for yes. the local there's, redistricting? They're supposed to be roughly essentially equal in yeah. population. Okay. Um, even though an action, as I say, has absolutely no consequence for the town because there are no representatives that are elected precinct. by precinct. Yeah. Right. Um, and finally, I went to the Board of Health and there may, and they elected a new chair um, who was um, Jill Block, who was, uh, um, who was formerly uh, one of the top executives at the open table. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, she, she replaced uh, Deborah Green as the chair of the committee. And the major discussion there was um, uh, the um, white pond mm -hmm. and the, um, the remedies for the uh, algae bloom and so on. Okay, thank you. Uh, Linda. Okay. So I didn't bring the ones from the week before, but I brought the ones from this week. I had five this week. Um, two from two meetings for the trustees of town donations. Um, they've been in a process of having um, the archivist and an intern um, for the town records source the original source documents for um, the donations to town donations. Um, the other major thing there is that they were um, sent out our, our request for proposals um, for new investment management firms for um, their portfolio, and um, they have selected Morgan Stanley. And that's the highlights there. Um, our districts commission um, dealt with a uh, number of routine, fairly routine um, applications um, in terms of public hearings. Um, there was one preliminary discussion for 615 Laurel Road, which is at the corner of um, Laurel and Barrett's Mill Road um, prior to the application, well, technically prior to the application being filed. And um, there was quite a cadre of neighbors who were objecting um, to the size and nature of the proposed building for that site, um, given the historic nature of that corner. So we'll hear, I think, a fair amount more about that going forward. 
Um, I attended the cemetery committee. They elected a new chair um, whose name is Leo Carroll. Uh, after Paul Cook had been there for a number of, of years uh, in the role of chair. Um, they are requesting that the community bikers to please um, bicycle only on paved surfaces. And they're going to be doing some um, tracking of for baseline as well as doing some monitoring to see if new signage is in any way going to uh, help with enforcement. And that continues to be a, a big concern for them there in terms of where the bikes are going. Um, and the main topic really had to do with uh, overall stewardship for the general landscape of the cemetery. And the committee is actually going to do a site visit coming up to uh, assess and suggest um, prioritization of projects. Um, so there was a lot of discussion about that. And then I attended the Concord Housing Authority and um, they were interested that the select board was going to be um, considering a DEI commission. At that point, it was just a consideration, so that was presented to them. Um, and they are likely to do a CPC application for their ComEd project. And the porches on Everett Gardens are in are structurally fading. Um, and, and falling apart actually. And so they are gonna be seeking funding for that. And I think that's the highlights there. Okay. The, the other, one other thing I will just mention there is that um, there were a number of um, delinquent rental payments and a program, um, the share program is helping recoup some of the lost revenue from people who lost their jobs mm -hmm. and are living in public housing. Mm -hmm. The which program? Shira. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. That's highlights there. Thank you. Um, I probably mentioned this once before, but the Comprehensive Sustainability and Energy Committee is going to have a sustainable home and energy event at Harvey Wheeler on September 13th. So that's something to look forward to. I also attended the Trails Committee, uh, which discussed. Um, a unauthorized uh, bike trail that had been built um, in the woods mm -hmm. uh, near Powder Mill Road uh, off of the Bruce Freeman Trail. And that's being remediated by the person that built it. And in fact, uh, they're going to create a hiking trail out of part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Trails Committee more broadly will identify, uh, start a project to identify trails suitable for bikes. They're their sense is that there won't be many, um, but there is, you know, certainly a lot to discuss around that. Um, and uh, they do, though, on the other hand, hope that working across some town departments, they could find some municipal land, and they assume it would be non-conservation land, where a mountain bike, dedicated mountain bike trail could be built, because actually mountain bike trails have this certain you know jumps and twists and turns that don't really uh you know some of them don't, don't fit with uh, the you know current structure of trails and they do see it as a need that that should be met in town um the recreation committee commission in addition to the discussion i mentioned earlier uh, adopted their amended administrative code and they formed a subcommittee to draft their strategic plan. Um, and then uh, I attended the middle school building committee, which we discussed a little bit earlier tonight, um, where they um, restaffed uh, the subcommittees. So we now have some new standing subcommittees, which we'll be meeting over the next couple months uh, for finance, uh, for design, and for communications. Um, and uh, then we got it m into some of the more details about the schematic design, particularly focused on windows, uh, but also materials. And there are some additional cost savings uh, updates that have been made to the design. So the budget currently stands at 100.2 
to 100.5 is the range uh, 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 at the moment. That's narrow. Wow. It's narrow and it's <laughs> it's very close, but not quite at our $100 million okay. goal, um, but very, very close. So that's it. All right. Thank so, you. And um, just really briefly before I forget on the Recreation Commission. Yeah. That administrative code has to be adopted by the select board. So it is going to be on the agenda next week. Okay, Linda? I was just going to comment, um, follow up to Matt's comment. You know, the, the interesting thing on the middle school uh, agendas now are cost savings. Mm -hmm. Where are we on budget? You know, they're mm -hmm. clearly putting this front and center on the agenda. So good. Yeah. Okay. All right, I had um, a few brief ones. Oh, and there was a sustainability subcommittee. I missed the fourth one. Sorry. Okay. But who is on that? Because we don't have a sustainability uh... director. No, but there were, there's okay. a sustainability professional, uh, Matt Root, Matt who's Root. Uh, okay. on, the, on the committee. Oh, good. Okay. All right. Um... Not that he's the only person that has an opinion there, but yeah. Mm. Okay, so just very briefly, I attended a school committee meeting. All children will be full-time in school, in person this year. The biggest question is masks. Uh, the school committee had a very good discussion about their goals for the year. They voted to adopt the capital planning task force recommendations and the dates that are in our calendar. And they approved the Concord Teachers Association three year contract. The Finance Committee uh, worked on sustained growth rate. And they have now put out their letters uh, for the guidelines. And they're starting to learn about ARPA, which is a new um, funding that we're going to get from COVID and from infrastructure. And We'll be hearing more about that here as well in the next few meetings. Um, the Transportation Advisory Committee is doing a comprehensive townwide speed study, um, hiring a consultant once we get funded. So as you recall, the select board maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago, voted a townwide 25 mile an hour speed limit. Mm -hmm. But there are other speed limits, and the question is, what supersedes what? Yeah. So it's pretty complicated, and um, the suggestion was made by Steve Duplin, the town engineer, that we do a comprehensive speed study throughout town, hiring a consultant once we can get funding for that. Is that something, that sounds like a big project that's only done periodically you haven't done it in a long time is that 1950s yeah. yeah it's a long time every half a century whether you need it or not <laughs> right so a lot of the speed limits in town are a little bit out of date <clears throat> from the 1950s uh but one of the things sorry terry oh, go ahead. just because susan asked the question yeah, about yeah. it one of the things that was a big part of the conversation though was looking at a methodology that is you know looking at the methodology too so it's not just the standard 85th yeah. percentile and looking at place for pedestrians and cyclists right. and other modes so that was, that was a big part of the conversation good yeah <laughs> yeah complete streets is the town policy yeah. right but the state law is out of date it's pretty complicated you know listening to this meeting tonight there are a lot of transportation issues that we have to do so we will pretty soon be doing that focused meeting on transportation um maybe october or something uh, the bike subcommittee of the tra uh, transportation advisory committee has been expanded to five. And so we are looking for people to apply for that. Um, and we did get a shared streets grant of $92,000 for Old Marlboro Road at the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail intersection oh. and Williams Road. So um, that's it for my liaison report. Uh, next, we have miscellaneous correspondence. We have one letter from Deborah Stark, one from Leslie Fisher, one from Mark Galis, and one from Tanya Galis. Thank you for submitting those letters. And we will go now to public comment. 
Anybody live have a public comment? Nope. Anybody on Zoom? Okay, we've talked long enough and everybody's turned off their Zoom. Right. So um, I think that's it then. We'll move to adjourn. Yep. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you for a great meeting. Again, we'll see.